OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Yes, indeed. It's Friday morning, the 8th of May. You're very welcome along to OTB AM. Adrian with you here and Owen with you there. Good morning to you, Owen. Good morning, Adrian. What's the crack? All right. How are you getting on? Very well. Can't complain. Um, fit of the stack show coming up over the course of the next two and a half hours. Of course, as always on a, on a Friday morning, crappy quiz coming your way a bit later on. Tipperary get the uh, Mount Rushmore treatment a bit more on that in a minute. But Fergus McFadden is going to join us on. He's a guy that probably 34 Ireland caps, like the guts of 200 appearances for Leinster, has been there across an unbelievable time for um, for the province in terms of Heineken Cups and general success. Um, probably is one of those players that maybe doesn't get the credit that he deserves. Like, utility was the phrase that um, Leo Cullen used in a very positive sense in the in his post-retirement utterance. But, yeah, maybe just doesn't quite, for the, for what he's achieved, maybe doesn't get the respect maybe he deserves. Yeah, like, so anybody who's got 30-something caps for Ireland, I think probably deserves a little bit more recognition. I, I don't think he, like, do we hold him in that sort of regard as somebody who's got... At uh, thirty, some what is it? Thirty three, thirty four caps. Uh, yeah. uh, at this point, uh, like it's a fairly bloody good career, and as you say, he's been involved with the greatest Leinster side of all time, possibly forcing his way into that team time and time again. So I think that's definitely true. What you say mm. that uh, like also as well the fact that he kind of came between two eras of great Le- Leinster teams. I mean, starting around the turn of the decade and then all the way up, obviously, until this brilliant team that they have at the moment. And I guess the unfortunate thing at the moment is that w- what is going to be the expiration date on the current Leinster team because of something like the coronavirus. They, they were obviously mm. set to, to go on and, and, and conquer Europe again this year, you, f- you felt. Like, they were certainly the favourites to do so. And I, I just wonder if uh, McFadden retiring is, like, indicative of the challenges that the great teams are going to, to face over the next couple of months, that things just won't be the same again for them if you were at the top of the hill before this. Yeah. Hard as nails is the other thing that people say about him like we'll have uh, a couple of people dropping in to pay tribute to him uh, over the course of the morning as well but hard as nails is the one thing that comes up repeatedly and I have something in the back of my mind and we must ask him about it that he at some point or another had a little bit of his ear loped off in a challenge at some point or another and you'll be familiar with the fact that he wore that headband for the last couple of years of his career I think there was I think it was for that reason but um, we must find out but hard as nails is the thing that comes up time and time again you could really tell as well he was um like, you know, Stephen Hunt is always remembered as that sort of um, player that sort of fizzed around the pitch when he came on and was always, like, full of life and full of energy. Um, like, Fergus McFadden definitely fell into that category of somebody who you knew was just going to um, just go for it every single time. Like, a player that I'm sure that, from a Munster point of view, and the, play, the teams that played them, he would annoy the hell out of. And you really can't ask any more uh, from one of your own than to be that, that guy. So, so, he was a Vander Holyfield in this uh, piece of mythology <laughs> that you've discovered. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that the the uh, action that we could ask him about it was as deliberate as uh, as what happened to poor Ollivander. Um, <laughs> but uh, from what I understand, Jed, yeah, it was... Um, I've never heard about uh, this. I re- yeah. like that the headband makes perfect sense because that is definitely a piece of clothing that was worn by Fergus yeah. McFadden for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, we'll ask him about it. We've plenty to talk to him about it. We do want to hear from you as well. 0879-180-180 if you want to get in touch with us over the course of the morning. And uh, you can get us on all the usual social channels as well. So hit us up there, whatever comments you have for us on this beautiful Friday morning. Hope the sun is out wherever it is that you are at. Uh, we really do want to hear from you, so get your comments coming in. We'll bring them to uh, to our audience over the course of the morning. We are going to kick off very shortly with John Giles. More on that in a second. We're going to uh, bring you the sports pages just after 8 o'clock, let you know what's happening across the back pages of this morning's newspapers. Uh, that Fergus McFadden interview uh, live and coming your way if you have any uh, comments for Fergus or congratulations on a pretty stellar career. That's just after 8.30 this morning, so uh, that will happen there. The uh, OTB Kids Takeover is just before 9 o'clock and in the hot seat from the Kids of Ireland. Uh, this morning will be the former Munster back, uh, Simon Zebo. So that's coming your way just before nine. After nine, Mickey Quinn is back off the couch. And he's got another great video coming your way. We'll chat to him about all the latest happenings in the world of GEA as well just after nine. After that, Tipperary gets the Mount Rushmore treatment this morning. And to do it, Alan Quinlan is going to be the main driver here. And uh, Mickey Quinlan is going to be, uh, Michael Quinlan is going to be his uh, conscience uh, over the course of that as well, just to keep him in check as well. Some interesting names in the mix for that and a crappy quiz just before 10 o'clock. It's the perfect way to round off your Friday morning. And to start your Friday morning, it's uh, John Giles, as always, picking his all-time 11, this time the Republic of Ireland. 
you mentioned Jim Beglin there and a player who, well, could well, if his career had gone differently, forced his way onto this team because he only ended up playing for the Republic of Ireland for 15 caps because of that shocking injury that he sustained. Yes. He was on the show last weekend, actually, and he was very complimentary about your role in his career and starting out at Shamrock Rovers and how you basically turned him from a probably naive culshi into a hardened professional. What, what are your memories of Beglin as, as a young player? Great memories. I, I would never describe him as a, as a, as a culshi in any way. Uh, he, he always had it, uh, uh, Nathan, because he had the attitude he had the ability, uh, he, he was one of the best young lads I've seen in terms of what he wants to do, what he needed to do, and was prepared to do it, which is usually hard work. Mm. Uh, and, and I found with, with Jim, you only had to tell him something once, and he did it. But as far as training was concerned, uh, and being a pro at a very young age, uh, he, he, was, he was brilliant to work with, and uh, he was a terrific lad. And as you say, he had a very, very unfortunate bad injury that uh, put an end to his career, uh, more or less, anyway. Uh, but Jim was, Jim was a dream uh, uh, for a manager or a coach to work with because he, he was dedicated to what he wanted to do and he was a terrific lad. It wasn't easy for him. He was only a young lad coming up to Dublin from Waterford at that mm. particular time. Uh, and he, but, but he got on with the job uh, and did it, did it brilliantly. Were you still Rovers' manager when he went to Liverpool that summer? No, I think I just you gone. Just, you just gone. Was, was he, by the way you talk about him, like, was he, like Liverpool are coming in at that stage, they're dominating European football. When you would have heard that he was going to Liverpool, would you have thought he's a player who can get to that standard? Oh, I had no doubt about him. Uh, I had no doubt about him, uh, Nathan, because he was such a good lad. He had the ability, and, and what you're looking for after that, well, what you're looking before that is, is the, the attitude, mm. the, the willing to work, the willing to, willing to learn, Jim had all that. He was Jim was a dream uh, uh, to have as, as a young a young boy uh, because he was he was determined that he was going to make the grade. He wanted to make the grade. He had the ability to, to do it, and, and all he needed then was the hard work, which he did without any doubt whatsoever. He really worked hard for what he needed to do, and the, he, as I say, he was he was he was he was a dream to to manage and coach. He was a terrific lad. Let's move on to our centre-backs then. Again, no yep. shortage of quality players and a really difficult uh, decision you had to make because you have the calibre of Paul McGrath, Kevin Moran, David O'Leary, Mark Lawrenson, Mick McCarthy, Charlie Hurley. The modern-day players, Richard Dunn is in there as well. The, yeah. All of those players fully deserving of a place in this sort of selection. Yeah, I had John O'Shea in there mm. as well, Gary Brain. Uh, I, I think you mentioned them all there, uh, uh, Phil Babb. Uh, in, 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 in that particular bunch. And it's very, very, again, difficult. Richard Dunn is in there. Uh, very, very difficult. But the, the two players I've gone with are Charlie Hurley and Paul McGrath. Right. Charlie Hurley is a, is a, is a name people will recognise, but obviously won't remember an awful lot of people actually playing. I know he had a, he had a very long and brilliant career at Sunderland. Clearly, uh, when he's getting into it, this sort of selection ahead of the likes of uh, Mark Lawrence and, and uh, Kevin Moran was a, a real quality centre half. Oh yeah, it's it's it's, it's a very difficult one. I mean, we have Dave O'Leary and, and as you say, Kevin Moran, uh, Mick McCarthy was in it. Paul McGrath, well, Paul McGrath's in it. Uh, but but Charlie, obviously, it, it, there, there's some people would remember him, uh, Nathan. The old guys would remember him. But Charlie was in 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 those days what we regard now as a footballing centre-half, you know? Mm. Charlie would be able to play today. He'd be one of the few centre-halves of that time where it was mostly headed away, don't be, don't be looking for too much on the ground. And Charlie was exceptional in those days and that his control of the ball was very, very good. And even in those days could take it out from the back, as we say, or play out from the back. So he was before, before his time uh, at that particular time, but he could do it. He was a big fella. Charlie was about six foot three, excellent in the air. Uh, it read the game well and, and, and had terrific control. So, uh, although we would go back a long time, I'd put Charlie in there. But the players that that, uh, that we had under Jack, for example, with, with Kevin Moore and Mark Lawrence and David O'Leary, uh, Mick McCarthy, Paul McGrath, I mean, these were outstanding players. And like when I'm, when I'm picking these teams, uh, Nathan, I hate looking at them and leaving them out of the team. But it's, it's only a bit of fun. But... Uh, but at the same time, I'd, I'd, I'd like to recognise how brilliant these particular players were. Uh, Paul McGrath, of course, 
uh, is in there and uh, and Charlie Early, who was long before these particular lads. Two centre-halves then who could both play a bit of football because Paul McGrath, as we know, was, was oh, just yeah. such a, yeah. a gifted... T- and played, yeah. in, played in midfield in, in huge games for club and for country. Yeah. Did, you, did you prefer him as a centre-back to a central midfielder? Well, well I, I think I said before, Nathan, on the programme, when you get a lad who can play like Paul can mm. play, the further you go back, the easier it is. You know? Because the further you go back, the more you're facing the play. So when you move somebody to midfield and they're obviously in front of the ball a lot, they have to turn on the ball, which Paul could do. Uh, but centre half, he was just majestic. You know, he was he was good in the air. He he, he could, of course, he could play. I mean, he could play anywhere. Paul would play yeah. anywhere and give you and give you a turn for it. You know, uh, but but playing centre half where he could see the game in front of him, read it, uh, was very very quick, brilliantly balanced for a big fella, and and excellent on the ball. And again, no show off. All these great players, Nathan, what they have in common, they're not out there to show off. They're out there to do the job. And I never saw Paul, Paul McGrath take a chance on it in the penalty barrier to show how good he was. You know, he just did it. He did the right things all the time. But he had to, you see, he was a deceptive, deceptive in pace, I think, Paul, mm. and balance. He was terrifically balanced, lad. Uh, but very, very pacey. Uh, when you saw him running, it, it was effortless to him. Well, most things looked effortless to Paul, uh, but his control was good. He could pass the ball and play in the centre half. I'd say it was it was a doddle for him in relation, say, to playing in the middle of the field where it would have been more difficult. So centre half, he was he was made for it. His, his control was good. His balance was good. His pace was good. He had everything that a centre half needed. And mm. Paul again was a modest guy. He wasn't trying to show off on the pitch. He got the ball. Gave it to the midfield players when he did, when he had the job done. Didn't try to show off in any way. And I know I'm talking a lot about showing off, but it's a very very important thing for lads not to lose the run of themselves on the pitch when they're playing well and, and think they can do all sorts of things. Keeping the head, doing the right things, being professional all the time is easier said than done. But Paul could do that brilliantly. I was watching back uh, Ireland against England, Italian 90 last week, and Paul McGrath played in the middle of midfield in that game, and it was striking. Like you touch on the pace that he had to watch him, and the ability when the knees weren't gone to just turn quickly on the ball and sprint away from a couple of players. Something that, yeah. when you think of the more recent Paul McGrath 1994 World Cup, when it was a real backs to the wall job against Italy and showed a, a totally different side. That, like that balance that you talk about is something that really stands out with McGrath as well. That he, he never looked uncomfortable or that he was been twisted and turned by attacking no. players is is that something that would have come quite naturally or something that that you learn very quickly in the game well i well i think the nat, the, the, the 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 athletic uh, athletic attributes if i'm saying that mm. rightly are there nathan you know i've seen lads who were well balanced in that but they couldn't read the game they couldn't control the ball very well so you have to do that as well so it's a combination of of of, of, a, of a number of things that make the great players which Paul had, you know, he had this turn of pace, which everybody, uh, everybody doesn't have a turn of pace. His control was good. He was good in the air. Uh, so this, this made him really the perfect centre-half. Uh, but it, there, there, there are lots of attributes that make a great player, again, attitude, attitude to the game uh, and uh, uh, modesty as well, Nathan. Not to be saying, look how, look how good I am. Uh, you know, the great players let people see how good they are without going out of their way uh, to do so. Uh, and because once they lose their head in that way, they're going to make mistakes. Mm. You know, and Paul, like, the, the thing is, what you find with Paul and great centre-halves, great players, and, and they used to say that when I was a kid coming to Manchester United, when it's simple, keep it simple. Don't try to show off. The time will come in a match where you have to do things like Paul did, where he wasn't showing off, he was just doing great things. But he wasn't going out of his way to do it. He just did it as it happened. And he had the, the, the natural abilities to do it. Read the game well, had good pace, good control and good balance. Yeah, what, so, more, what more can you look for, <laughs> Nathan? Just going to what say more that. can you look for, Nathan? Let's get on to the midfield then, John. I think you're going to go to three-man midfield? Yes. So, again, as you go across the midfield, so many possibilities from Ray Houghton, Jason McAteer, Jerry Daly on the opposite wing. You could have the likes of Kevin Sheedy, Liam Brady in there, Andy Townsend, Roy Keane, Ronnie Whelan, Mick Martin, John Sheridan. You're not going to pick yourself in this, as you've pointed out already. So what, what, what three have you gone with? 
the three I've gone with is uh, uh, Ronnie Whelan, right. Roy Keane, and Liam Brady. It's not a bad midfield. No. <laughs> it's it's they, brilliant, isn't it? Those, those three brilliant. work well together, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think they, well, I think they would have played together mm. at some stage. Uh, not, not on a regular basis, but they would have played together. But, uh, like, Ronnie, Ronnie, was, Ronnie, Ronnie was, again, played in the star-studded Liverpool team, uh, Nathan. And with not playing for England, I don't think, probably didn't get the credit that he deserved and what he contributed to the Liverpool team. Uh, but obviously for people in the game, obviously, and people who followed, followed Liverpool realised what, what Ronnie did. But when you're playing with Dalglish and Rush and Hansen and, and Souness, it, it, it's, not, it's not easy to get the headlines. Mm. Uh, but there again, I don't think Ronnie, like most of the terrific, terrific players, great players that I know, don't care about the headlines, Nathan. You know, they're more concerned about doing the stuff on the pitch, contributing to the team effort, which Ronnie did. And Ronnie did it in a big way. He was a very, very skillful lad, a good attitude to the game, uh, did his stuff. Uh, again, simple when it was on to be a go, simple, didn't try to show off, got on with the job being a professional and, and, and had, had a great career. I think Ronnie was a terrific player. And incredible. He would have been, would have been underrated, I mm. think, Nathan, in relation to, say, Graham Sinesh, Dalk Leash, these. Uh, you know, these were great players that he that he played with. But Ronnie did did his bit more than did his bit for, in that particular team and with the Irish team. An incredible when you look back in his career, he makes his breakthrough into that Liverpool team as a 19-year-old. It's a Liverpool team that have just won the European Cup and he plays a huge amount of games in the 81-82 season where they win the league. He goes on to win six yeah. leagues. He wins wins the European Cup. And you talk a lot about you know players if they if they're good enough age doesn't matter for him to force his way into that side of that quality at nineteen twenty is is quite yeah. remarkable. Yeah, I think he was always an outstanding player, outstanding schoolboy. Actually, when I was at Rovers, I tried to sign him because I knew his la his dad, Ron Ronnie Senior. Mm. I played with Ronnie Senior, would right. you believe? Yeah, in in the international team, uh, who's who's also a very 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 good player. He played for St. Pat's. Uh, he didn't play midfield. He was more striker. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, we're just having a slight problem with John's line at the moment. Uh, we're talking about Ronnie Whelan. The midfield, uh, in case you missed it there, is Ronnie Whelan, Roy Keane and Lee Brady. I don't think anyone can have any complaints. Sorry, John, you're, ba you're back with us there. You were just talking about, about, about how you yeah. tried to sign uh, a very young uh, Ronnie Whelan at one stage. Yeah, yeah, he was... Well, I, I was in charge. I, was, I think I was in charge of the under-18 team, mm. the, the U team at that. And I, honestly, Ronnie was a, an outstanding player. Uh, and I think he was—he was—he was, he was already gone to Liverpool at that particular time. Uh, but as you say, he, he didn't—he didn't have to be there very long to establish himself. He was—he was extremely good player. Of course, his father before him, I think, would have given him a lot of good co coaching. Ronnie Senior, who was a, a very, very, very good player. Uh, but Ronnie settled in, I think. I, like some lads are like that, you know. They're, they're, they're pros, they're professionals from the time they're born, uh, uh, Nathan. And yeah. I think Ronnie—Ronnie Ronnie was like that. He no problem settling into the Liverpool team, getting into the Liverpool team and establishing himself there. He was excellent. Maybe the, one of the reasons why he was underrated, and you do often see him uh, put up there as maybe Liverpool's most underrated player, was that there wasn't one thing that stood out. Even at times he would play out in the wing, but he wasn't your stereotypical tricky winger. He wasn't the Souness archetypal real tough guy. He just sort of did everything really well. Yeah, well, as I say, when you're playing in the stars to the team, Nathan, I know I'm repeating myself a couple of times here, you've got Kenny, Kenny Douglas, Rush, Souness, Hansen, uh, and like it's, it's, it's hard to, to stand out mm. above those guys, but they know, and, 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 the, and the, the people behind the scenes, whether it be Paisley, whoever was his manager, would know the value. I mean, there's one thing with publicity, that's one thing element of the game. It's probably the least important element to the game uh, in terms of, of, of people like uh, Ronnie. And again, Ronnie, like when, you, when you're playing for the Republic of Ireland, Nathan, in England, you don't get an awful lot of publicity for it. You know, whereas mm -hmm. if you're playing for, for, for England, for example, uh, and I'm only talking about the press, press situation, I'd say Ronnie, Ronnie wouldn't care about that. And the players around him wouldn't be bothered about that. Either they know what he did, and the pros would know what he did on the pitch, where it really mattered. But he he was an unsung hero in many ways. But again, it showed his professionalism, in that he didn't try to force himself into the limelight. 
Because when players start to try to force themselves in, they make complete idiots of themselves, Nathan. And the pros at the club, the manager and the players around him, wouldn't have it at all. Ronnie accepted what his role was in the team. If he never was going to be one of the, the high flyers, as it were, in the press and that, it didn't bother, them, bother him in any way. He was, he was a pro and got on with the job and did it brilliantly. Your other two midfielders then, Roy Keane was in your Manchester United eleven, and Liam Brady was in your Arsenal eleven, and um, you spoke brilliantly, I think, about both of them at the time. From an Irish point of view, it's hard to talk in some ways about Roy without uh, bringing up Saipan, and we only have 10 minutes left, so we better not go down that route no. again. Hey, does that, though, tarnish in any way when you think about Roy Keane in Ireland? No, I, I don't think it, it, it tarnishes Roy Keane as a player, Nathan, in any way. It was an unfortunate thing that happened, and as you say, we're better off not talking about <laughs> it than talking about it, because there's more to talk about in Roy Keane than that particular incident. I, I think it was a pity it happened, because uh, I think we could have done even better in the World Cup at that particular time with Roy Keane playing. There's no doubt about that. I mean, Roy Keane was one of the great players. Nathan. Unfortunately, that happened. But as far as the playing is concerned... I mean, I've often said about Roy Keane, if, 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 if I was in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in, in trouble in a war, I'd want Roy Keane beside me. Uh, and, and one of the biggest compliments I can pay, pay him, Roy Keane was at his best when the team needed him the most. Mm. In other words, if you were winning 3-0, Roy Keane could go off the pitch. You know? But if you're losing 1-0 or 2-0 with 15, 20 minutes to go, he was the man that was going to drive it on for Manchester United and Ireland as well. That's the, that's the temperament, that's the personality he had, uh, Nathan. Never satisfied with himself. And, and I found with all the great players, great players are never satisfied with themselves. When I hear them after a match talking, they've had a great game, and they're concentrating the two or three things or four things they didn't do well. So the things that you do well, you take for granted. The things you didn't do well, you've got to put right. But I never saw Roy Keane where he was satisfied with himself on the pitch. Now, that's his temperament as well. I think there were, there were times maybe with his teammates, he could have been a little bit kinder to them mm. in certain situations, but not very often. He was driving, driving, driving. But the big thing was, he wasn't just driving his mates. He was driving himself. Yeah. So if you needed somebody, if I needed somebody beside me in a hard match, very difficult, and people getting stuck in and doing other things, that's very, very difficult. I'd want Roy Keane beside me. As I said, people should listen back to the Arsenal eleven uh, to listen to you talking about Liam Brady and just what a beautiful player he was. So uh, no doubt I don't think that he was ever going to be in there. The attacking players then, the three attacking players, again, the selection that you have available to you, Robbie Keane and all the goals he scored, Niall Quinn, Tony Cascarino, Damien Duff, Steve Highway, Frank Stapleton, uh, Don Givens, Terry Conway... There is a lot of good quality attacking players who, who perform brilliantly for club and country in there. Who have you gone as your front three? I've gone with Frank Stapleton, okay. Robbie Keane, right. and Steve Highway. Steve Highway. No Damien yes. Duff. No Damien. I'm sorry to say. I love Damien, uh, but I have to pick. This is the hard part of it, uh, Nathan, you know, that I have to do. I have to leave people like him out. Mm. I'm not leaving them out because it's, 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 only a, it's only a bit of fun, but that's, that's, that's my opinion on it. And I'll just say a quick word on Liam Brady. Liam Brady was a beautiful player, uh, Nathan. You know, and I mean beautiful because mm. he was easy to watch. He could go past people. He could do all the things. I, he, was, he, was, he was absolutely brilliant player, and he did it for, for the ice team. He did it for Arsenal as well. But to watch him, he had that attitude, well, not attitude, style, that he looked easy, 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 and next thing he's flying past players. So I'll finish on that. Wonderful player and would definitely be has to be in my team. Yeah. But to talk about the other lads, as you say, there's a few lads you could mention in, in, in the forwards there. Uh, that Don Gibbons, for example, in my time, you know, when, when, when we started to do well, he scored four, three goals against the USSR, four goals in the next match mm. against hmm. Turkey, and then two. Uh, he, 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 he was on, he was, he was, that's, when he was on a, on a run, he was on a run. But I, I, I just, we won't have time to talk about them all, uh, Nathan. But Steve Highway, some people would remember. Steve Highway was an, an, a, a winger. Yeah. And there's not many wingers around. There wasn't that many around in my day as well. But could go past people very, very quick. Uh, uh, could, really, could really play. So, so, but to leave the other lads out, I, feel, I, I always feel guilty about it. 
Yeah, you know, talk you know, a bit more about Highway there, because obviously for for some of us, like having an Ireland eleven without Damien Duff seems unimaginable. But then you look at what Steve Highway achieved during his career, again in a brilliant Liverpool team, always hmm. getting picked, four league titles, part of their first two European Cup winning sides. Uh, like, would he have been a similar player to Damien Duff? Uh, well, well, first of all, he was a right-footed player yeah. on the left wing. Um, he, he, well. Damien did what he did, which was to go past people as well. So did Steve, Steve Highway, you know. Uh, but as you said, the things that he won and, and the team that he was in at that particular st time, it, well, the reason I picked him is obviously, I mean, Damien, I feel, I think the world of Damien, but I'd, I'd have to on, uh, honestly pick uh, Steve Highway because of the, the attributes he had. He could go past people. He was very, very quick. He could score a few goals. He could make a lot of goals. But uh, he, was, he, was, he was a natural left winger that really did his stuff for Liverpool, uh, uh, Nathan, there's no doubt about that. He would have played a lot for you as well when you were the Irish manager. When, when he pulled on the green jersey of Ireland then, was he able to replicate that club form? Um, well, we, well, he played in the bad old days as well when hmm. we weren't going very well. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, he could, he could play uh, whatever, he, whatever situation he was in, uh, Nathan. Like he, he, there's a lot of times now he wasn't released by... There was, there was a time now when I was managing him before. It, it, it wasn't uh, automatic that you could get released. The club had to give you permission to pick the player. You didn't have to release the player. So there was lots of times. Obviously, Liverpool didn't, uh, didn't want to release him. Right. Now it's automatic, as you know, Nathan. Like it, 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 that's why the players now are medically examined if they don't turn up and that. Because in those days, the manager used to say, uh, Don Reeve was the same with me, I'm not releasing you. And that was it. But Steve, when he did play, played. Yeah. Uh, Robbie Keane, an automatic selection, I guess? I think so. Well, Robbie's a great goal-scoring record, as we know. Mm. Uh, I mean, to score the amount of goals he goal for Dillon was, was, was phenomenal uh, because we weren't always a top team. Nathan, as we know. Yeah, like it is uh, six, 68 international goals for the Republic of Ireland is, is a bit insane. Well, it's brilliant. Mm. It's brilliant. I think Robbie was a natural goal scorer. I think from the time he was a kid. There, there are players like that and what happens a lot, they come alive when there's a goal, a goal scoring chance. I mean, Robbie wasn't a great player outside the box. You wouldn't expect him to be. But, but obviously he's looking, looking, looking and it's this instinct they have, these great goal scorers. Uh, to see see it before anybody else, and that's what Robbie did. And also having the ability that when you do see it and get there, to put it away. Yeah, I mean, the, the Robbie's goal scoring record for the Irish team uh, has been phenomenal, phenomenal. W and, was uh, it was it Alan Clark you were talking about last week that always had that sort of inner confidence that even if he missed three chances, he always felt he was going to score the next one. Oh, definitely. Did Robbie have that? I, I don't think I don't think Robbie was as arrogant as Alan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I'm, I'm only half joking now. But Alan was a terrific finisher. All these finishers have it, Nathan, mm. that they really come alive when there's a goal scoring chance. You know, they're ahead of everybody else. They know what they're going to do before any, before before anybody knows what they're even trying to do. And it's a, it's a natural gift to be able to do it to stay calm. Uh, and, and, and because it's the hardest thing is scoring goals in, on a football pitch, definitely the hardest thing to do. Uh, and they make it look easy. Mm. And the, what, what was great about Robbie's record, I mean, Robbie wasn't playing for Brazil or Argentina yeah. where they were on top all the time. You know, a lot of the time we, we, were, we were up against it. So Robbie didn't have that many chances. So to get the goals that he scored uh, uh, was, was phenomenal. He was just a natural goal scorer. I think he had it from the time he was three years old. Hmm. Mentioning uh, the amount of goals then probably brings us on to Frank Stapleton just before we finish up because he was the record goal scorer with 20 goals in his 71 caps. Uh, again, a player who had a brilliant club career from Arsenal to Manchester United and went all around the place after that. And before Robbie Keane, like Frank Stapleton would have been seen as Ireland's greatest ever striker. Well, I, I think he was an, an all-round player. Mm. Uh, I think Robbie was a complete goal scorer. And uh, sometimes, like, like with Robbie, sometimes it would be out of the match for 15, 20 minutes, and next thing he scored in a goal. Frank Stapleton was, was in the match all the time. In other words, he contributed in a way, as a tar I used to call it, the target man in my day. Uh, and he was a good positional player in that to link it up, Nathan. Even if he wasn't scoring goals, he was able to link it up and would probably make more goals for his, t his side than Robbie would. Yeah. You know? Because he's more all-round all type of player. 
uh, that, that played in that position. In other words, he was the ta- we used to call the time when you could hit him, he could hold it well and bring players into the game. And he was brilliant at that. And a very very good in the air as well. Mm. But really intelligent player for linking it, linking it up. You know, I played with Frank a few times when I was in the coming near the end of my days. And I, when I was in the mid, I could always find him easily. Right. Even in, 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 in a tight area, you could find him, you could play it into him and he could lay it off to, right. lay it off to or go on his own, whatever he wanted to do with the ball. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. OTB's Mount Rushmore. 32 counties, one county representative choosing their sporting Mount Rushmore. Some decisions are easy. Number one cornerstone on this monument is Stephen Staunton. And I would wager that by the age of 21, he probably had a CV like on par with anything we've seen in Irish sport. Others are controversial. Michael Murphy might actually be debated as whether he deserved to be there any more than some of the players from 1992. Join the debate across all our social channels at Off The Ball. Galway is so diverse. I think Galway people can feel fairly proud of them good. And catch the live decision-making over the next few months on OTB AM, live every weekday at 7.30 AM on OTB Sports Radio. OTB AM. Yeah, it's OTB AM on this Friday morning, just gone 8 o'clock. A very good morning to you. I hope it's uh, good wherever you are and hope that you're well. Owen, how are you getting on? Very well. How are you? Just listening to the uh, OTB Mount Rushmore promo there and the contention that tends to arise over these things. I want to get heated at times. The loud one was pretty heated uh, during the week with Dan and Ronan. Uh, we've Tipperary coming up, of course, later on. My main thought, to be honest with you, listening to that was, thank Christ, Westmeath is done because I can sit back now and relax and uh, just watch all these other ones flow in, Owen. I'm just delighted that my county is out of the way. You could say it was the one with the least contention so far, Westmeath. Is that down to you being extremely persuasive? Like, Conor Moore had the opportunity to change something he under did. Matt Rushmore, yeah. and he didn't change a single head. So yeah. is that down I, to... I was expecting a bit more... It, it could have got... You're, look, you're right. And I think that, actually, it's a great... The, the Westmeath episode of Mount Rushmore is a great lesson for every other county... Um, and for every other human being in the country and beyond on in how to do your business that, you know, don't need to get into a great, you know, debates online, sort of, you know, airing, airing your, uh, laundry, your, your laundry in public on, I think is the expression that, that's used here. You know, there was just a lot of bono me and ultimately we came to the right decision. What's, what's the slang name for Westmeath as a county? The, 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 oh, come on. the, the, low, the low lying fields or whatever it's called like you can change it to the fuss free county now at this point because you managed to kind of prance on in here and actually chisel those foreheads out with no fuss whatsoever no fuss that's just the way Westmead go about their business it's the Lake County on come on oh yes sake. of course that's um, uh, but anyway yeah, you're, probably, you're probably right it was probably the, the least contentious uh, Connor definitely I was almost expecting a bit more rancor towards the end but I think that like it's Jesus, it's a difficult position to be in. Actually, I have to say at the end there, where you're, where you've put your four on the line, and the other person has the opportunity to take one of those off, and you're kind of thinking, well, you know, you're you're of the view, and it was the same in the loud one. You're of the view. You've come to that four that actually, like you're of the view, obviously having put a lot of thought into it, that they're the four that should be up there. And it's actually difficult then for difficult really to arrive at a decision afterwards where somebody is saying, well, you're going to get to take this one off. Um, but yeah, I think the right. I think we we came to the right decision. I I, I mean, was, are you are you insinuating that Westmeath has so such little pick to choose from that we kind of there was really no bone of contention? Is that your that what you're offering forward here? No, I'd never suggest such a thing like that. I was just getting yeah. into the mind of the most, as I said, the most fuss free county. And how did you do it? Is my question. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, it it was uh, it was a thoroughly enjoyable process. I don't know. Um, uh, how much contention we're going to have later on for Tipperary because they, you know, obviously a very heavy GEA county and there are so many names that trip off the tongue in relation to that. Um, Nikki English and Owen Kelly are obviously two that will be, I presume, primary in the uh, conversation with the two lads. Um, mm. You know, Dennis Leamy is in there. Quinny himself might be in there. I mean, it's well, di- he's a difficult position now because he's got the John Giles about it here where he can't really be seen to be chiselling his own face into the bleeding mountain. Well, this is the tricky situation we're, we're in later on this morning because both Quinlan and Quinlivan both go down as two of the greatest Tipperary sports people in their given sport. Now, Quinlivan, obviously, he might say that he's got, still got 
a bit of a part to play perhaps in future years for Tipperary football and I think the trend so far has been that current players haven't had a huge amount of success in these yeah. sort of things. It's a cop-out obviously, but go on. It is a cop-out completely, but there is a theory out there that he is Tipperary's greatest ever footballer. Uh, Alan Quinlan, uh, on the other hand, uh, is, there, is he uh, Tipperary's greatest ever rugby player? You could definitely make a case for that. and. Mm. By that definition, then he has to be in contention. So he's he's in a very tricky. I don't envy Alan Quinlan. You know, I've, I've uh, uh, like I I think a lot of people have had tough calls to make down through the weeks already here, like Colin Buhig in Cork, for example. But I think it doesn't come tougher yeah. for somebody uh, than Alan Quinlan this morning because, yeah. like, what do you do? Well, like it's a it's a lose lose situation. Either you come across as somebody who's going to chisel your own head into the mountain, or you're going to be left out looking up at the foreheads, thinking to yourself, well, that could have been me. I think you just go for it. Oh, will be my view. I think if you feel that you should be up there, you go for it because, like the uh, whoever's chosen the various Mount Rushmores, are really only going to be a footnote in this entire thing. It's you know the the legacy is the granite or whatever it is they're going to be chiselled into. Um, you know that's the legacy. It's not about who chose them. So I think you know forget about the short term backlash you're going to get. If you feel you should be up there, up you go, up you pop. I will say Tipperary is a Paul Rouse dream, possibly the best uh, historical county out there. Like we, we've had a couple of situations here where a county may pop up with one, maybe two worldwide top class athletes from say the uh, 20th or from the 19th century or from the, the 1910s, 1920s who may have, I don't know, who may have represented Britain in uh, the Olympics and, and have done well. Tipperary, mm. for, by my count, have three top class stars if you go way back they, they've got the the only ever irish uh, female champion at wimbledon in lena rice they've got bob tisdall uh, it's a, there's a podcast up there for anybody who wants to listen to paul rouse on the show with us i think in 2016 yeah it would have been around rio so 2016 he, he gives us the story of pop, bob tisdall absolutely incredible part of uh, what is known as ireland's greatest ever hour on uh, the, the track and field stage when himself and pat o'callaghan took home uh, a rake of gold medals all within an hour of each other i think uh, and then you've got as well Tom Kiley uh, as well, um, who's if, if you go back through, I think it was the all around the the event used to be known as some bizarre version of the decathlon back in uh, the early part of the, the 20th century, uh, where he would have won obviously flying under the Union Jack at that point, but still a tip man. Mm. Yeah, that's incredible, like a Wimbledon champion. I mean, they, and I think part some of the. Um, Mount Rushmore's have been sort of devoured by recency bias, so I hope that because like some of those achievements that you've mentioned there are um, will be second to none, you know. And there are other people, the likes of Charlie Swan, obviously be in the mix as well. You assume, um, and it's always difficult to know. We're back to that when you're into the racing world. Are the, is it the uh, the jockey, the trainer, the owner, the horse who actually takes responsibility? And to be fair, he was associated with Istabrak for a lot of years, so you know, some would say that I could have been on Istabrak, oh, and we would have got the job done as a partnership. Yeah, that might let's, be let's, let's revisit that theory sometime for sure. Uh, like like the, the one thing that has been indisputable, actually no, it has been very much disputed, I, actually I should say, is the importance of moments when it comes to these lists. So for example, it, it's, it's been greatness that that's been chosen, without question. That's why Seamus Darby doesn't make the Offaly Mount Rushmore, it's why Matt Connor eventually did make uh, the Offaly Mount Rushmore. So where does someone like Shane Long lie in a Mount Rushmore discussion, I wonder? Like obviously has the moment, but also has yeah. a hugely accomplished career behind him. I think it's difficult to have a Tipperary Mount Rushmore without Shane Long. Mm. Like it does come back to the conversation that I know we definitely had in relation to the West Mead one. That you know, it's a it's such a popular sport that almost by nature of it, that if you have somebody that has achieved, are you talking about the hurling or the, the football now? The soccer. Just just clarifying because of course he would have been a, a fond place in the hearts of of many Tipperary sure. fans. And you could wander down your Steve Staunton route with that and sort of, when you're looking to make yourself feel better about the decision, say, well, listen, you know, he had a bit of a GA career as well, but listen, he wasn't going up on Rushmore on that basis. Um, it's a nice little extra caveat. Um, but I do think that, like, given the... You, it's not it's not really a time for um, criticising Shane Long's career and what he might have achieved, would be my view. I think that it's a time for reflecting on... Um, you know, the amazing things he did, the number of caps that he amassed, as you say, the moments that he's had um, in an Ireland shirt. And like, that's the stuff. That's really, that's the that's the rationale. And difficult, I think, as I said, I think that if you've achieved something in a sport like football, that's 
so prominent, um, prevalent worldwide, then actually it probably tips you ahead already of some of the other the other uh, contenders. Without question, yeah, I think he's he, he's possibly going to be one of the, the first heads up there as well. But mm. like, the, there's just so many people at a, at a very similar level as well. It's the hurling conversation, which is going to be uh, extremely uh, divisive here, I would have thought. Yeah. One last one on this before we leave it and we move on with the rest of the show um, in relation to the Kerry one. The, your difficulty, I think, in terms of you, you, you will be relying on that cop out, right? Like of such and such is still active. Um, but you'll be able to do it quite easily because there's such an array of like unbelievable names to pick from outside of that. But is there anybody on the current Kerry scene, football or otherwise, that you'd be thinking um, will be worthy of uh, inclusion or certainly discussion? I, I don't think so, to be honest. Like, yeah, I, I, I don't think that, like you can make the David Clifford case and like it's I, too early. Yeah, it's just too soon. It, it's too soon yeah. for a crowd. Like, I mean, there, there's been two All Ireland medals won in the last whatever twelve years. At this point, you're going to be going up against people with. Uh, four times that uh, in some cases and uh, close to four times that so I don't think so and also as well I, I think that I, I, I don't think it's a cop out to say that somebody who's currently playing shouldn't be involved in a Mount Rushmore discussion I, I think that actually time is a good thing for these I think that uh, as time passes by I think it gives us a full appreciation for how good a player was in particular I, I, I think mm. it, it is very hard to I think there's very few people at the moment in football where or maybe we've actually just got better at this, that we're actually like appreciate these moments in people's careers while we have them. And I think that there's that case around Stephen Cluxon. I think there's that case around Brian Fenton. I think there's probably a case around it with Clifford at the moment as well. That mm. he, he was such a breath of fresh air as soon as he landed that everybody was like, we just need to soak this in. Yeah, I, I am of the view that it's a total cop-out. Like my view on the Robbie Henshaw one, for example, right? So he's included in the West Meath one, is that if he had... If he was to suffer a career-ending injury, uh, which in the current climate it seems highly unlikely, uh, tomorrow would he be included in the Mount Rushmore? And the answer is yes. Well, yeah, okay. I, 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 I think that's the. I think I that's the. Saying. But I, I think I, that's the logic. I, I still think that in uh, down the line, when when you when you get used to watching another midfielder, for example, or somebody who isn't as good as Robbie Henshaw, I'm not saying that, that that's the rationale for getting nostalgic about players who've played in the past. But that, down the line, I think that there's just a greater appreciation for everything, isn't there? Like, I mean, mm. in that nostalgia is a powerful thing and having a bit of time away from actually not, not watching him week in, week out is a powerful thing as well. And I, I don't think it is a cop-out, to be honest. I think, like, the Robbie Henshaw situation is because he is legitimately one of Westmead's greatest ever sports people, mm. Westmead's greatest ever rugby player, and he's playing right now. That, that's a fact, and that's what you're dealing with. Whereas I think with like you're not comparing like with like if you're looking at Henshaw and David Clifford. Like David Clifford no, is, uh, that. is in the yeah. embryonic stage of his interview. Absolutely. Career. Like if David Clifford was playing for Westmead, would he would he get on that? Like he would have been up no. to discussion, obviously, in a way that that um, exactly in a way that he probably won't be in the Kerry one. But no, that's 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 ultimately the uh, a fair answer at the end of it all. So look, at, you've probably getting sweaty palms already just discussing this thing. Um, you have a few weeks to play with Jet. Do you know when your D date is? I know with Mead coming up on Monday mm. that Tommy Rooney has been already sort of putting out a few um, a bit of a doing a bit of fishing for. Um, you've any set date for the call up? Yeah, I think it's after the June bank holiday, perhaps actually the day after the June bank holiday Monday. Well, that's uh, going to ruin your bank holiday straight off the bat. Straight off the bat. That's why I need to get cracking on it now so I can uh, enjoy my bank holiday. Because, uh, it, like, I know that it's kind of tongue-in-cheek and we're like, oh, the sense of responsibility and all that. But we're not. People at home, this is the one time we're actually not being sarcastic. It is actually yeah. uh, a, a truly big... Really, like, it's going to be the thing that uh, we all get most hate for because you are representing... There is a sense of representation about it and it is so easy to completely mess it up. Yeah, you think like that right up until the eleventh hour, and then you're like, "Oh crap!" I actually, this is there is the the weight of responsibility has landed on my shoulders. Uh, do get in contact with us uh, this morning, oh eight seven nine one eighty one eighty on WhatsApp if you want to drop us a message. Uh, and as always, on any of our social channels as well, Alan O'Neill has been in contact on YouTube this morning, just to simply say, "Morning, lads," and "Good morning to you, Alan." Hope you're well wherever it is you're at, and uh, do get your comments.
into us this morning. We'll bring them to our uh, audience. Right, we're going to um, give you a bit of a flavour of what's coming up on the show this morning. We're going to get stuck into the sports pages in just a couple of moments' time and let you know what's uh, what's going on there across the back pages this morning. Fergus McFadden has announced his retirement uh, from rugby and we're going to speak with him a, just after half past eight this morning. So again, any comments for Fergus, get them into us. The OTB kids... Takeover is coming your way after that. Simon Zebo in the hot seat this morning. So exactly what it is the kids of Ireland have put to Simon Zebo some tricky questions in there. Uh, that is just before nine. And after nine, Mickey Quinn uh, is off the couch for you this morning with his latest video. Uh, the Mount Rushmore for Tipperary is just uh, after that at about quarter past nine this morning if you're uh, setting your alarm to uh, come back to us at that stage. And the crappy quiz just before 10 o'clock where um, myself and Tommy and Nathan will go head to head and I'm sure another seamless version of the crappy quiz. But right now it's time for the back pages. OTB AM. And we're going to kick things off with offtheball.com uh, for you this morning. Lots of great stuff up there. The John Giles 11 that we mentioned a little bit earlier on. A few contentious calls in there, it has to be said as well. Um, so as specific comments as well about the quality of Roy Keane. Uh, all up on offtheball.com this morning. Tommy Welch's take on the lockdown. Simon Zebo uh, is asked, which is better, Cork or Paris? Uh, as part of the OTB kids takeover. So it doesn't come any trickier than that. That's uh, all up on offtheball.com this morning. The Irish Independent this morning leads with a photograph from Hanover yesterday as racing got back underway. You've got uh, jockeys wearing visors and protective masks there uh, resumed behind closed doors in Germany yesterday. The main story, top four tournaments plan as League of Ireland cling to return hopes, writes Dan MacDonald. Uh, a four-team tournament, including European qualifiers Dundalk, Shamrock Rovers, Derry City and Bohemians, has emerged as a possible experiment for a return to play in the summer, with the logistics of hosting it in the Aviva Stadium being considered. Now, the cost from a health perspective has been highlighted by a quote in excess of 50 grand for a test for every player and official in the Premier and First Divisions. It is unclear, McDonald writes, uh, about whether or not uh, there will be, um, where those funds would actually come from. So uh, it's mm. a good piece by Dan this morning. And uh, Niall Quinn uh, has said on Wednesday that the FBI has engaged with government health officials to clarify what the details they out and the government's roadmap for reopening business and society means for soccer. Because we've seen it in the last couple of days with the GEA that the roadmap isn't necessarily where the organisations are going to take their orders from. That it doesn't necessarily mean that because you can, by the letter of the law, bring uh, small sessions back by the start or the middle of June. It doesn't mean that it's the right thing to do for every organisation and the, the GA obviously kicking that back till the end of July. And then the other story, which is kind of a theme across the back pages this morning, Paddy Talley has been out saying this could be the shake-up the GEA has needed. And I think it's a, an opportunity for reflection for pretty much everybody in the world at the moment and an organisation like the GEA that needs a lot of thought and a lot of reflection to solve the many issues that it has and the spider web of different interests that exist across the association now could be a vital time for, for the GEA to have a think mm. about where it wants to be in a year or two years time. Part of the difficulty is that we could fall into that Brexit territory where the UK government got so obsessed with talking about one issue for the best part of three or four years before obviously all this stuff kicked off that you take the eye off the ball of everything else. So we get so focused in trying to decide on a date that ultimately actually the GEA themselves are probably largely not going to really decide on. It's going to come from other quarters that you don't really take the time to say... Um, you know, I don't know if he's got any specific areas that he feels are worthy of looking at, but you know that it's there is a difficulty that you get sort of distracted by um, a very worthy conversation, but one that's hard to actually influence outside of um, direct direction from the government. Yeah, like just to clarify what he, what he wants, he wants to see the training to games ratio for club and county players improve greatly, and he says that there is no need for an inter-county season to be any longer than four or five months for most, basically in line with the, the, the NFL in America with games mm. week on week. Uh, and Talley says many of those involved in games won't just jump straight back into the rat race if and when restrictions ease completely. So uh, a lot of food for thought, he says. People will be thinking about how much time is required to run off an inter-county season and how much time is required to run off a, a club season as well. Yeah, I mean, the only difficulty, obviously, the GEA are, very, are, are quite progressive within the structures that they have, organisation anyway, like they're constantly tweaking structures and rules and all that stuff. Um, like, it's not as if they sit in their hands for decades on end, um, you know. Yeah, like, uh, you could make the argument, though, that there could have been a bit more progressiveness as well. Like, I mean, there has been changes made, and uh, I think that that kind of indicates 
where the organisation is at, that it's been so close to... A lot, a lot of the structures have been so close to breaking point for so long that change had to happen, essentially. Mm. But, like, I, I wonder sometimes if the, the best fix... Not even the best fix, but just if, I wonder if the best thing to do right now, if they, can, if they do come to a situation where they're calling off the year, use that time to just say to yourself, in an ideal world, how would the 2021 GA calendar look? Or even 2022, I, I, mm. in a situation where coronavirus does not exist and, every, and say, say normalcy, do, normalcy does return, what would be your ideal calendar? I think all the big players in the GEA should be proposing what their ideal calendar looks like. Yeah. And then I think to reach that point, ripping up the current script is probably the way to do that. Yeah, interesting times, I think, for everybody from a sport and business point of view, that everybody has got a little bit more creative than they uh, they might have uh, considered previously or, or that they might have liked. Even that League of Ireland idea, I love it, like that idea of sort of the best four teams in the league playing off at some point or another. It doesn't have to be necessarily related to the um, idea of closing the season. That actually, it just sounds like a bloody fantastic um, week of football if they could get it on at some point. Um, the Irish Examiner this morning is uh, leading the way here. A picture of two seamstress seamstresses at Into Sport. Uh, clothing company Kilkenny who've uh, moved from making GEA gear into medical scrubs that leads the way there Owen Cormican uh, with the story of the Cork chair Tracy Kennedy backing the GEA's call uh, to keep grounds shut uh, until July of this year um, technically obviously permitted to reopen under the government's phase plan in 10 days time but uh, several GEA voices asking for the grounds to open obviously but then uh, Tracy Kennedy here is not one of them I can't see any reason she says uh, why we do anything other than prioritise public safety, and I certainly wouldn't want to be responsible for putting anybody's health and safety at risk. It's a real point of contention in GA at the minute as to whether those clubs should be open or not, but um, the Cork are clearly falling down on one side of that. John Fogarty writes about the clubs having to shell out their um, insurance premiums regardless of whether they're going to be open or closed. Uh, Central Council has paid apparently the £6 million um, that was due and the six month window for repaying that from clubs to the GA uh, is now up so apparently they're looking for that money and it seems there will be some sort of a checks and balances here with a bit of a saving of the player injury benefit fund um, which is a knock on of obviously not having any action and that may help to slightly balance the books but nevertheless those premiums have to be paid and one last one from the Irish Examiner Stephen Barry has a reflection there in the career as you can see of the uh, awfully great Paddy Malloy who passed away this week uh, he tells us how Paddy started uh, as a goalkeeper and played in every single line of the team over a pretty stellar 16 year career The Irish Times this morning leads with a piece with G former GEA president Liam O'Neill he's been speaking to Sean Moran also, again, kind of on the same theme that Paddy Talley was speaking about, about what the opportunity is. The headline here is that O'Neill hopes shutdown can be used to implement change. Uh, so he says, imagine we were starting the GEA from scratch in 2021 and what it might look like. That is a suggestion that, that he is making for, for people who might have a bit of time to reconsider how the GEA looks. Only two years ago, uh, a committee established by O'Neill's successor as president, Egon O'Farrell, to identify challenges ahead as the association moves towards its 150th anniversary delivered a radical report that was promptly buried and not even released for discussion writes Sean Moran which is a good point and then Liam O'Neill makes this very valid point and I think it kind of comes back to your idea there that the GEA have chopped and changed a bit. Uh, O'Neill says we've changed more radically in the 50 years since the McNamee Commission than we had done in the previous 87 and now it's nearly 20 years since the SRC which is obviously the report that was uh, brought into play, the Strategic uh, Review Committee report uh, that in 2002, which obviously changed the game entirely for the likes of Dublin. Uh, like, it's, what are we now? The, it'll be 19 years this year since the first year of the qualifiers. If you look at the football championship in isolation, since then there's been the introduction of the Super 8s. Outside of that, what has been the real radical change for an organisation that's actually darting towards professionalism and certainly darting towards a situation where more intercounty games is what people want to see on the on the wider scale, and I don't mean that on the kind of lower down. Obviously, the, the club player is getting screwed over in so many ways, but like the training to games ratio has obviously been one of the biggest issues of being an intercounty footballer. And having only taken one step since the introduction of the qualifiers, uh, it seems like a, an organisation that hasn't changed all that much. But perhaps now is the opportunity to arrest that a small bit. Uh, the other GEA piece I should mention here that's kind of across the, the back pages this morning is uh, Michael Murphy, 
he, he still sees hope and reason for football uh, in 2020. He's all for bringing back the championship this year or, or playing behind closed doors. He doesn't say behind closed doors, but he does say you're looking over at Germany at the moment. The sport is getting back up and running, and that might just be a very easy comparison to make. But that's what I'm hopefully looking for, football this year. And again, it's everyone's personal view, but I'm still hopeful of football this year and he says I just want football back if it's done through Ulster well and good if it's done through a 32 county open draw bring it on too so just wants to get back out and playing Michael Murphy and as I say it doesn't stay behind closed doors but you'd imagine if he's making the Germany comparison he'd be okay with that as long as he's playing so that like the GA earlier this week said that there isn't an appetite in the wider association for behind closed doors championship there's one of your biggest most famous footballers saying that he would look at the Germany model and actually be happy to go along with it. Yeah, speaking of Germany, it's, uh, you can see from the Times London edition this morning, uh, the UK Times, that racing is back there. Uh, you can see that photograph up on the uh, top left of your screen there. Empty grounds and jockeys in face masks is exactly the approach there. It, uh, I do wonder if Irish or UK jockeys are going to make the trip over, if there's work to be had. Um, is it legit for them to get over there? Would they be interested in that sort of thing? Um, we shall see. And obviously France had to follow suit as well. Um, unrest in the Premier League. I mean, while with some clubs not happy with the suggested ending uh, to the season and those obviously in relegation danger particularly displeased about it uh, more on that on some of the other papers as well and Alex Lowe writes about they've always uh, over the last few weeks uh, the UK Times managed to drum up some sort of a rugby story that doesn't exist elsewhere and this one's from Alex Lowe writing about Japan still very much interested in hosting the Lions next year as part of that South African tour uh, Warren Gatland had been suggesting that uh, a New Zealand showdown I mean I don't know why he'd be suggesting this thing but a New Zealand showdown as an extra game uh, will be a great thing to do I mean it's hard to argue against it but to be fair I think Japan have been given indications that they're um, set to host one of these things and they are still putting their hand up very much to say listen we're here lads Come on over. The Irish Daily Mail this morning leads with Michael Murphy as well. Hope is all we have. Donegal ace Murphy is keeping faith that GEA fans will see a 2020 championship. And Philip Quinn writing today that we'd have won the World Cup with Lineker. That's a quote from Jack Charlton. Today is his 85th birthday and uh, Philip Quinn has been speaking to Tony Cascarino saying around Italia 90, Jack was always looking for a pacey centre forward like England had with Lineker. Aldo was our quickest, but he wasn't as fast as Lineker who could beat defenders to the ball over the top. So that's what uh, Jack Charlton told him after they lost the quarterfinal. So uh, imagine being Tony Cascarino or John Aldridge at that point and uh, being told that, you know, if it, wasn't, if it wasn't you but Gary Lineker instead, we might have gone all the way. <laughs> <laughs> a real man manager, wasn't he? That's um, you know taking care of the, the player's ego. Um, you know, it's sort of reassuring there that Big Jack had, uh, had had that going on, as we have assumed from the various players that he's called over the year that uh, certainly existed in the background. Um, in the Daily Mirror this morning, in the Irish version of it, I think it's the UK version you can see there, but in the Irish version, Paula here's a story about the League of Ireland uh, not getting back until September. Uh, that Michael Murphy story, can't wait to go back to football as well. Uh, John Cross has a story about the Brighton uh, CEO, that's the one you can see in front of you there, Restart Revolt, uh, saying that neutral venues aren't a runner. Uh, six clubs, we're told, have been vocal against them, uh, but the Brighton CEO saying that uh, many more than the, just those six uh, aren't happy about the entire thing and this is something that we expect to run and run and, and exactly how much it stalls Premier League plans um, we shall see but that's set to run uh, and a bizarre photo you can see there on the uh, bottom right of, from it's from a Chinese baseball game where they've placed cardboard cutouts around the ground to make it look full I mean I don't know if this is something that uh, you know we're going to see at um, Austin Stack Park on or at uh, Parnell Park or Crow Park it's, it's it's slightly bizarre. It's haunting. It's like mm. the premise for a horror movie. Like you, you could almost picture picture like a, a serial killer that comes to life in the middle of a crowd of carbo cutouts. Like I get the, you sort of get the, <laughs> you totally get the rationale for it. Like the last thing you want to be looking at is an empty ground. Like Tomman Park, you know, <laughs> no. Tomman Park was redesigned. They obviously put those different coloured seats in for those games where they knew there weren't going to be a, there wasn't going to be a full attendance, and it makes it look slightly as if there are actually people there. I don't get the rationale um, for it. No, there is no rationale. Well, the for rationale it. is that you don't want to be looking at an empty ground, and actually, like I, I think players are smart enough to realise that they aren't real human it's, beings. I, it's nothing to do with the players, obviously. It's the TV audience, and and also, by the way, like. Um, 
if it needs saying. Like, I don't think they're going to be taking any close-up shots of the crowd anytime soon, like in, uh, in celebration after the home run. I think it's just for those fleeting shots to give some sort of an impression of... Like, oh, look at this great atmosphere. When it went I, mean, up, I don't know. Are they pumping in? Are they pumping in? I know you, you lads were chatting about it during the week. Are they pumping in, like, cheers and jeers? Hopefully. It would only be a real football crowd as well if they had a few cardboard cutouts of middle-aged men doing lewd hand gestures towards <laughs> the people. Yeah. Newcastle fans without their shirts on, that sort of thing. That, that's exactly it. I would, I'd be all for that. I, I could see the rationale for that, but I think it's just... It would be haunt- Like, imagine the silence and just seeing 50,000 faces around you. Like, how... I don't see. Look, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I don't, has anybody really done a like great study on how this should work or shouldn't work? But that baseball example was uh, like three or four. Like it was like a front row of fans. Listen, I mean, I I feel I'm now in in the. Uh, I feel as if it's now on me to make the case as to why there should be cardboard cutouts it in is. Uh, sports stadiums around the world. And I feel slightly uncomfortable in, with that pressure. <laughs> I'm not against it. I I I would be all for looking. Looking at, uh, I haven't seen the actual footage of this game. I'd love to have a look and see if, because it's just for fleeting TV shots. And it, it's obviously just for fleeting TV shots. Like you, you could have a bit of fun with it as well. You could you could put people sitting beside each other that clearly don't get on. Like in terms of the celebrity section that the camera often yeah. has to. Like it, it was have... it was a cool idea. That, like it was a German club that uh, had started putting faces of their fans into the ground, wasn't it? Because, you know, they were missing out mm. in football and stuff. Like, it's a nice idea. I, I get it, but... Uh, you could do... Um, you could get that guy, that awfully knobhead. Uh, the, is he Kerry Knobhead? The guy who always goes to the, the majors in his jersey. You could, like, put a full life-size version of him around there, the fairways. There are multiple Kerry gentlemen who do that. Not just one person, and he's not a knobhead. Gentlemen. Very, mm. very nice people. Uh, Many knobheads is what you're saying. Back page of uh, the Irish. Oh, back page of the Irish Daily Star this morning. While I dropped my newspaper, is uh, people will starve. Um, it's Davy Russell, uh, with like hitting out fairly hard as the decision to push return to June 29th. Basically, when it comes to racing, just to go through some of his uh, quotes, people are going to be in an awful hole. Some jockeys and trainers are really struggling. It's crazy, absolutely crazy. We have to stay fit and keep going. Horses have routines. They still have to be written out. Uh, he says, uh, footballers or rugby players can train at home by themselves. Racehorses obviously can't do that. It's soul-destroying. People are going to starve. People are going to go out of business. I know it's very, very tough for every business. I don't want to sound like racing is special, but a closed coffee shop is not spending money, except maybe on rent. Horses still have to be fed and maintained. Staff and bets have to be paid, but there's no money coming in. It's interesting, as you say, Adrian, Like, if there is jockeys without work, is there going to be opportunities for them in a country like Germany who has racing going ahead? There's obviously a very finite amount, so I'd have my doubts around that. But mm. um, June 29th, as uh, David Russell mentioning there, when the return to racing is currently stated for. An interesting one here by Paul Lennon. Hickey's book on the way. Pat Hickey, due to release a book at some point over the next 12 months before the 2021 Tokyo Olympics. Unclear whether or not he has secured a publisher or not yet. Uh, Sanchez clash, meanwhile. Manchester United are on a fresh collision course uh, with outcast Alexis Sanchez. Uh, so he spent the year on loan, obviously, at Inter Milan. And the terms of the deal obviously end on June 30th. With top level football obviously suspended. Does he mean? Does that mean he actually has to, to stay beyond that? Does he get to the end of the season if the season is resumed? That is currently the predicament that Manchester United and Alexis Sanchez uh, face. And then Rebel Alliance, we've got the numbers up here at the top left. Brighton Chief Executive Paul Barber has warned the Premier League is facing a full-scale revolt over the project restart plans. It might not be a full-scale revolt, but it's certainly six teams who are hugely unhappy with the prospect of relegation happening. Pat Hickey book. I mean, I don't know if this is the absence of sport that has me all excited about it, but I'm definitely reading that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, would, it would, I would definitely be curious to see what's contained within the covers of the book. That, that's for sure. His backside, I'm assuming, features it largely. It depends who the ghostwriter is, obviously. Yeah. Um, Dara Tool's been in touch about the cardboard cutouts on. Uh, it's got people exercised this morning. Uh, he says either that or the world's greatest cardboard salesman has had a profitable outcome. Uh, possibly, like, are we... They're not very weather-resistant uh, cardboard, pieces well, of cardboard. Yeah, that's a good point. Like, are we not... Well-laminated. Yeah, well-laminated or, or plastic, good-quality plastic. Like, uh, uh, that's that's probably the, the only way we can do it. 
It's a conversation worth having. The Irish Sun for you this morning, Neil O'Reardon, on the fact that some League of Ireland clubs are going to miss out on European money. Uh, Dundalk, Bowes, Rovers, Derry, this is on the Irish version. Um, all due to play at various stages, obviously, but who knows if that if those games are even going to take place now. So significant doubt about that and the impact that that lack, uh, loss of revenue would have on those clubs, I'm sure, as well. Uh, and so many different offshoots of uh, these delays. Obviously, the latest one is that some clubs are concerned in the Premier League that Liverpool are so far ahead that if the season returns at some point, uh, to be run off, that because of the condensed nature of running quickly uh, into a new season, that Liverpool would perhaps rest all of their best players. So clubs have already played them twice, clearly aren't happy with that. The Herald this morning, they've been, uh, they're noticed something on the back page, but on the inside we've got Eamon Carr finishing his list of the top 10 sporting moments that have happened in Dublin. Do you want to take a guess at what's top the list? Of the top 10 sporting moments that have taken place in Dublin. Yeah, so the list so far, number 10 was Ali at Croker, number 9 was the International Rules in 98, Aga Khan hat-trick in 79, McCullough versus Bueno in 96, Ireland versus Brazil in 87, Ireland's 85 Triple Crown, Ireland against Italy in 1985, Dunn versus Cordoba in 2009, and Santry Gold a Mile in 1958. Is the Tour de France up there? It's not at the top 10, it's a, it's a ropey occasion. The All Blacks win? No, Ireland against England, 07, Croke Park. That ah, fair enough. The headline, Tribal Exorcism at Croke Park as Irish thrive on the emotions. So that's uh, the and main you, story inside the Herald. You know that putting a rugby moment at the top of that list, the those who like to get outraged are going to be pretty outraged by it. And it's in a, a GEA stadium that also has hosted football, so... All the more reason to be outraged on is how I would see that. In the uh, Guardian this morning, Saracens players, the latest uh, boneheads to decide that they need to, uh, needed to meet up for a coffee, that they would flout uh, lockdown advice and just gather for a bit of a, a chat. And uh, the other story to mention, there are Premier League players uh, to get their voice as part of the Premier League's project restart. Uh, Premier League shareholders are going to meet on Monday, whereas Paul McKinney's here, after which uh, players are going to have the chance to speak about their own concerns and I presume ideas as well. Uh, that's in relation to the Premier League return. Finally for me then, the Daily Telegraph leads with a story about World Rugby. More men called Brett than women. World Rugby Committee attacked as old boys club. Uh, Beaumont won re-election while backing female game. It's a, it's a great story here. Two Bretts on the committee, Brett Gosper and Brett Robinson. Uh, so Brett Gosper, the chief, chief executive, Brett Robinson uh, of Rugby Australia. So there's two Bretts, one woman on the World Rugby Committee and uh, a few dissenting voices about that carried as the main story at the back of the Daily Telegraph. Project Restart route takes a toxic turn, meanwhile. As I uh, alluded to, the bottom six refusing to back down over neutral venues. Rebel clubs threatened with points deduction. So uh, a couple of clubs coming out quite vocally. You need 14 votes in favour of um, a ballot playing games at neutral venues to close out the season. Paul Barber, as I've said, the Brighton chief executive, not happy with that. He said an unfair relegation in the midst of a global pandemic would be catastrophic for his club and that he could not endorse something that put, stake, put at stake food on the table for families. But there's been a couple of voices clarifying that or hitting back at that. You've got Deputy Chief Constable Mark Robinson of the South Yorkshire Police on the record here as well. Uh, he says, comments such as, we might get relegated, we don't want to play at neutral venues. When we played them away, there were fans in the stadium. We play at home without fans, that's a disadvantage. We want to get the trophy. I get that in a football context. These are all a big deal. But I think people making these comments really need to get a grip, given everything that's, that's happened. And then also clubs are being told that the consequences of getting relegated, or sorry, of not completing the season, rather, will be far worse than the losses of dropping into the championship because relegated teams get parachute payments. So uh, a couple of points there to refute Paul Barber, the Brighton CEO, who's been quite vocal on this. Yeah, and last of all to the Irish news here and uh, Rory Gallagher, the uh, Derry manager, saying that most counties have written off 2020, not necessarily a reflection of his views. He's just saying that that's what his sense of having spoken to a bunch of people that a lot of uh, inter-county teams and managers have decided already that 2020 isn't part of their plan. So um, we shall see how that plays out. That's the Irish news for you this morning and that wraps up the uh, newspapers for you at uh, 8.38 on this Friday morning. Um, we've lots still to come. You're watching OTB AM, the sports breakfast show from Off the Ball is with you every weekday morning from half past seven. You can get in touch with us on all the usual social channels if you want to drop us a comment which many of you have been this morning, do keep those coming in. Uh, or if you want to drop us a text on WhatsApp, 0879-180-180. And you can check out as well, by the way, the full OTB podcast network. If you head along to offtheball.com, you can check out all of our latest podcasts from all the shows 
um, and uh, they'll all live for you there. Right, uh, we are turning our attention to rugby. The 34 uh, times Ireland capped 14 seasons with Leinster. Uh, Fergus McFadden has called time in a brilliant career this week and delighted to say he's going to join us next on OTB AM for, uh, for a chat. First, though, one of Fergus's uh, former teammates got in touch with us when he heard that he'd be joining us this morning. Take a look. Ferg, huge congrats on a brilliant Leinster and Ireland career. Um, you know, I love playing in the same team as you, be it in blue or in green. And not only were you the life and soul of the dressing room, but more importantly, the way you delivered in big games when the going got tough. You know, you were the ones that one of the ones that people turned to um, when it was time to roll your sleeves up. Um, I have not known anyone with an insatiable appetite for pain quite like you. Competitiveness personified and just an unwillingness to ever give up. And I think they're the real traits that will serve you well in the next life as well. You look at your trophy cabinet, phenomenal, um, multiple wins with Leinster and Ireland. Um, but I think it's the friendships and the, the mark that you have left on the players that you played with is the most impressive thing. And who will ever forget that ovation you got back in 2014 when you came on against Italy in the 65th minute. So um, happy retirement and it was a pleasure. Lovely stuff from Brian Driscoll. Fergus McFadden, good morning to you. Hey, how are things? How are you getting on? Yeah, Grant, as, as well as you could be, I suppose, in the current climate. Um, it's been obviously a, a mad enough few days uh, for for me. Just after Sunday, the phone was um, was very busy. So uh, yeah, it was um, it was it was a bit bit nuts. Yeah, what's it what's it been like? Sort of listening to people like Brian there, and I presume other uh, I was going to say former, but I presume some current as well yeah, players and coaches, and I presume uh, people getting in touch to congratulate you. Yeah, I think like. When initially when I gave the statement day to Leinster, I thought, you know, I was just, you know, I, I have been building myself up um, for this for quite a while, so I thought I'd be fine. And um, then I suppose just when I started getting the messages and hearing from family and friends and, and current and past players, that that's kind of when it got a, a little bit emotional at times. But, um, you know, very, very much happy emotions. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm very proud of... of, of what I've been involved in throughout my career, and I feel very lucky as well. Yeah, and rightly so. I, I, when you say it's been, you've been thinking about it for a while. Did you know at the start of the season this was going to be your last? Yeah, pretty much. Like, um, I was kind of toying with this, um, probably even this previous season, just thinking about when I was going to do it. Uh, and then I signed on for for one more year, and then when I did that. Um, just that talking to my wife and 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 stuff like that. I I I thought finishing this year. I'm turning 34 next June. Um, I feel like you know I I don't have as many caps as the likes of a Jamie Heaslip or others, but uh, there's a fair fair few miles under the clock, and and I think I've gotten a lot out of my body. Um, I also wanted to try and finish when I was I felt like I was still adding a fair bit on the pitch. Um, which I think you know any of the opportunities I have had this year I've I've done I, I feel so um, yeah I just I just felt it was the right time this year to, to, to finish up at the end and you know try to do it somewhat on my own terms I, at least my body's in one piece and listen if, if the pandemic means that I, I don't never play for I don't play for, for Leinster again then you know I can only be grateful for what I've had so far and, and if I do then fantastic that's the way I'm looking at it really it must have been a huge temptation, Fergus, to, um, like you say, you are going at your own terms. You're still a fairly young man, like in sporting terms, a lot of players would eke another two, three, four years out of their uh, out of their career. It must have been hugely tempting to either at Leinster or somewhere else to have notched up another uh, another year. Uh, it, w it was a little bit, but, um, you know, as much as I respect guys that have, have managed uh to play on into their mid 30s and some into their late 30s um it just wasn't for me I, I think i've had a great run of it um and i just think I, I i felt like this year was was just i wanted to once i signed the contract i wanted to just enjoy every last day that i had knowing that it was going to be my last and um you know up to the point of us being sent home with the with the pandemic i, I felt like i did 
Yeah. And so what's the once you've decided then that this is this is what I'm doing, have you were the people at Leinster aware before um, at the start of the season or who's the first person you're I often wonder who's the first person you ring in an official sense to say, listen, that's it, I'm I'm out. Yeah. Uh I just the first person in Leinster or in the rugby environment, so my family would have kind of known that that's what I was I decided to do, but uh was Leo. Um you know, I've uh He's obviously my boss for the past few years, but I've had a, I had an extremely good relationship with him as as a player, and um, I've also had a very good relationship with him when he's been my coach. So um, I just had a kind of matter of fact conversation with him at pretty much the start of the season, and um, I told him that we had, you know, that that was going to be my decision. So. Yeah. I remember um, Bernard Brogan a couple of years ago saying that he had a similar conversation with Jim Jim Gavin coming towards the end of his days. It felt like Bernard was sitting down with Jim Gavin with the express intention that, you know, hopefully he says, well, listen, we sort of still need you around the place. Was that part of your thinking or what was the response from Leo when you uh, when you had that conversation? Listen, I, I, I don't know what Leo's, like, you know, Leo kind of just said, let's, let's try to win some trophies. Uh, um, uh, and uh, I think, the best thing about him that's kind of always been um, one of his best characteristics is um, he's had so much success as a player and a coach, but he's always looking forward. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, there wasn't really much nostalgic chat. It was just um, about the current season and, and crack on and and we'd have, you know, hopefully nicer conversations about looking back in the past later on in the year. Yeah, how do you um, when you look back over like we mentioned about the number of caps, obviously in the, is it? it I I was looking at it last night. Do you you obviously played in two of the four Heineken Cup finals um, that Leinster would have won over those years, and you would have played a part in others. You were obviously injured uh, for one of them. Maybe selection went against you in another. How many actual Heineken Cup medals do you have? Um. Well, I've actually, I've actually got four. <laughs> I probably okay. shouldn't have four. <laughs> I've played in, played in three competitions. Uh, I was in the two, in the 2009 year. I played quite a lot in the, the Celtic League or the, the Magnus League. Uh, but Czechs never never capped me that year in the in the Heineken Cup. I was 24th man, I think, for around seven games. Uh, I was 24th man for the final as well. Uh, and I still have great memories of that. I, like, you know, it was at the, at the time, it was one of the first or second years, second years in the in the senior squad. And I was just, I was just delighted to be that close to it for, you know, Leinster to win the Heineken Cup for the first time ever. I wasn't like, mm-hmm. oh God, like I, as much as I would have loved to have been picked, you know, the, the team was so talented at that stage in the back line. I was just trying to learn as much as possible from the likes of Brian, Gordon, Shaggy, um, Gervin Dempsey. You know, obviously Rob had broken on and Luke was there. Um, and, you know, Felipe as well, who got injured obviously in the semi. But um, just all of those guys were there and I, and I looked up to them so much in school. Uh, so I, I was just I was just trying to sponge off them as much as possible to learn and... and, and um, yeah, so I think it's it's three medals I have official, and then, but funnily enough, actually. <laughs> um, in that video before you came on, Vergas, where Brian O'Driscoll was talking about you, he said that you have an insatiable appetite for pain. Uh, what does that mean specifically? Is it that you were the hardest trainer? Does it mean that you would go in for tackles that other people perhaps wouldn't? Do you know what? Um, it's been just hearing some of the stuff that past players and the likes of Brian have said, uh, it's just, it's, it really has been, been pretty emotional for me because, um, you know, when you're in the trenches with guys, you know, in games where sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but, you know, I don't think there's any other workplace, uh, or sport really, where you, where you could really get to know someone as much as being a professional rugby player. I think, um, you know, between selection, either going your way or not going your way one week or, you know, the highs and lows of winning, losing, um, you know, winning trophies today on, or winning trophies uh, at the end of the seasons um, and having so many great days together, uh, you really do build a bond that I think is just kind of there for forever. And um, I don't know. I mean, the people that said this stuff about me, you can kind of ask them, but uh, I suppose... I suppose I worked for everything, everything I got really, you know, I, I, um, I was, I was never, you know, the absolute quickest, 
you know, as ever, never the absolute, you know, most skillful player, but I probably got the most out of myself, and I think maybe guys respected that. I guess when yeah. they, they see you soldiering along in the trenches beside them, and you are going to a level uh, above yourself, even that that you perhaps feel you could achieve week in, week out, that just garners a, a whole pile of respect from them. It's uh, almost the, the level of effort that not only that they expected, but that perhaps took people by surprise, or that uh, like you can hear that's the thing that O'Driscoll goes for uh, in, in the, the voice message there. That clearly this is the thing that people uh, were impressed by because. It's a hard thing to sometimes identify who actually has the highest work rate or who has the, the most appetite for pain, but clearly it's something that you had that struck out to your teammates. Yeah, I think so. I don't know. It, it, Brian, um, you know, when I, I, me and Brian used to get pretty competitive in training. Obviously, he's one of the best competitors of all time um, for, for Leinster and Ireland. And uh, during training, during the summer, one of the pre-seasons we had... Um, we we're playing these these games with Joe Schmidt as like a double touch drill, uh, and um, a few weeks before he had blocked me a few times in the games, and it's kind of it was it was crafty because the, you know Joe couldn't have blown it up for it being um, foul play. So a couple of weeks later, then I I blocked him once, and we kind of went through for a try. And in those um, in those fitness games, if if you're on the back foot and a team starts scoring, you can do an awful lot of running. So we started scoring consecutively and. Uh, he he had said when I blocked him the first time, if you do that again, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, hit you a box. And I was like, okay, so I ran on. So I did do it again, and uh, yeah, we, it was it was a bit of handbags, and then uh, he hit me, he hit me a slap, and he and he and he, and he split my eye, but we had to be pulled up, pulled <laughs> off to <two of> us. <laughs> uh, Joe Schmidt sent me inside, and I went into Vincent's to John Ryan to get my eyes stitched up, but. You know, then I caught talk to him that evening, and everything was grand. Like, um, I think, but by the sounds of things, like that was just uh, just such a lovely thing to hear from Brian because I was lucky enough to, you know, look up to him uh, in school coming out of um, coming out of uh, when I played school as rugby. You know, I massively looked up to him, and then from to become a teammate and, uh, and and such a good friend, it's been a pretty lovely journey. Uh, so from to say that stuff. Uh, it's kind of the ultimate compliment, really, coming from the best to ever do it. Especially because he punched you in the face once. <laughs> exactly. But, uh, we were actually, listen, it was water under the bridge straight away. Like <laughs> I've, I've done things on the field uh, in training and, and I, I, I've thrown the weight around that I have here, so um, I can't complain too much. How do you reflect on the like the the overall achievements, Fergus? Like you, you, you yourself have sort of spoken about um, yeah, I suppose your own limitations, and I'm using your own terminology there rather than my own. But in terms of you know um, the 34 caps and the achievements that you've had, like do you reflect on it and say, Jesus, that was unbelievable. I never imagined I would get that. Or because there were times I know specifically over the last few years, there was three or four years ago, you were you were um, you were a first pick uh, first pick winger for Ireland. You were in the form of your life, and you got injured. There were there were definitely a couple of injuries along the road there that might have resulted in a few more caps. How do you reflect in an overall sense? Could it have been 50, or actually was the 34 pretty good going? Um, I don't really reflect like that. I've kind of, you know, naturally in professional sport, I think when you start, you know, I was lucky to come into the environment when um, things really started to pick up and throw it, the trophy started to come and, and the timing of it was nice. Um, but I, 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 I don't want to be one of those people that looks back and goes, God, you know, if that just happened, I could have you know, really got 10 more caps or, you know, um, won those few more trophies. I think I'm just grateful for the journey that I was on. I, I, I can only be grateful for it. Um, you know, there's, a, of course, there's going to be a couple of finals. Maybe you, you look back at and go, God, it could have been a couple of medals there in, in the league that slipped away. Um, but, uh, you know, the, 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 the experiences um, and, and the medals have been... Uh, have thankfully um, they came thick and fast in around the 2011 to, to kind of 14 period, so I can't complain. Yeah, there was, and like there was chat as well at times where there was a couple of selections that went your way instead of I know like Tommy Ball at one point, and there was always that sort of chat about you know he was one of Joe's favourites almost. Did that stuff piss you off, or you just sort of pay no attention to it? Um, I wouldn't like. 
probably around three or four years in to, to, to playing, I was I didn't really read a whole lot of stuff um, that was that was written, whether it was really positive or or uh, really negative. I found that was really the best approach. Um, because if you know if you, if you're if you're riding high and and you're you're, you're reading all the stuff that people are pumping pumping you up, uh, it, it's only it's only going to take a week really before some bad performance and then people think you know you're you're uh, the worst thing ever. So I think you just need to be careful enough about that. And and listen, the thing about sport is the fans are entitled to their opinion. You know, like I've only got uh, you know uh, lovely messages and love from from fans over the past. Uh, you know, a few days, and and that's been lovely. And um, like most of the fans that I've met after games, uh, were always um, you know uh, lovely to, to deal with. So um, I can't complain. And like I wonder, because you mentioned obviously at the at the start about maybe getting back into a Leinster jersey at some point. Are you, from a mindset and a lifestyle point of view, at the minute, are you like getting stuck into the Doritos and thinking, listen, it ain't happening? Or uh, what's your where's your mindset at at the minute? Stuck into the Doritos. Not really into Doritos, to be honest with you. Uh, more trying to steer clear, having a few too many beers. Um, but uh, it's not really. Um, I'm not really going to do that when my, my wife is um, pretty much, you know, 11 months pregnant. So. Uh, All right. Congrats. That's keeping me on the straight and narrow, along with my my two year old son, who's keeping me, me busy during the day. Um, and I'm doing a fair bit of training. I've got a, a, a kind of makeshift gym and a treadmill, and I do a bit of running um, on a Sea Point Rugby Club, pretty close by. So um, yeah, I mean, listen, I, the, the training. It, I'm doing all the sessions that are prescribed from Leinster, but um, a lot of it is just to, to get a bit of a clearer headspace. It's a very difficult time for I think everyone at the moment being stuck in their houses, and the uncertainty for what's going on. I mean, obviously, it's it's it's. You know, very disappointed to see what's happened to Leinster season, and if it does finish, it be it would be a real pity. But there's bigger things going on in the world. I think of people um, losing loved ones and losing fully losing their jobs. Um, it's uh, there's a lot of tragedy around, and you just gotta you just gotta sit back and and you know uh, say we're pretty grateful in the position we're in. It, it must, yeah, and go on. I'm sorry, sorry Adrian. It, it just must be a very strange situation, Fergus, not knowing when. The season is going to end, and by extension, when the career is going to end. A, a little bit, but um, you know, I'm kind of, I'm preparing myself that it probably is finished. But at the same time, um, I'm doing plenty of training to keep myself nice and fit. I, you know, I'm staying connected to, um, been in touch with a lot of the lads. I've, I've been in touch with Leo uh, and Stuart. So, um, you know, if it goes back and and. Um, and the season does roll on and they do need me, then, of course, I'd love to be involved. Mm. And please, God, that does happen. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's like, I mean, no matter... How, I've been in the professional rugby for quite a while, so um, no matter how ready you think you are, until that day comes mm. when you retire, you know, you're not really going to know how you feel. So, um, and that was the emotions probably the last couple of days where... Um, I was probably a good bit more emotional than I expected. So you just don't know what way you're going to feel. And the pandemic <clears throat> uncertainty on top of that doesn't help. But um, I've got plenty of distractions around the house to, to, to keep me occupied. So it's all right. How annoying is it when people ask you what happens next and what your post-career plans are? <laughs> well, the one the good thing with the lockdown is that hasn't happened a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'm... I'm sure those questions will come thick and fast after. Uh, but my plan at the moment is to um, sit back after touch wood. My, my, my wife has her second child. Uh, enjoy that, that, that a couple of months after that. And, um, you know, assess my opportunities and options from there. I've been, I've been uh, which I've turned my way up, really. One of the things that strikes me about the Leinster players of your generation, especially, and especially the career you've had, is the characters that you've worked with, and not even just the coaches, like the characters of Cheka to Schmidt to, to Leo Cullen uh, to Stuart Lancaster. If nothing else, there are huge life experiences, I'd imagine, to take away from the experiences of those four men alone and the different attitudes they have towards life. And I'm not talking about coaching here. I'm talking about the wider sense of what you can learn, whether it's business, whether it's your own personal life, that, that those guys would have taught you, I'd imagine, over the last decade or so. 
Yeah, perhaps. I, I'm, I'm sure there'd be, there'd be an awful lot of transferables from um, the high performance environment I've been been in and working under, you know, so many fantastic coaches, so many kind of different coaches as well. Mm-hmm. You know, talk about Czechs there, then you talk about Joe Schmidt, talk about Lee, you talk about Stuart, even Matt O'Connor, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and and all the assistant coaches then, and coaches that have been coached with, with Ireland, you know, Declan Kidney was also very different to those guys. I've mentioned Les Kiss, a, a great coach. Um, so, yeah, all of those guys um, definitely taught me different things and, and hopefully I can bring them into the, the next step in my life. Yeah, they're particularly useful when you're dealing with uh, dirty nappies, obviously. It's <laughs> those, those, those learnings. Um, listen, it's a pleasure catching up with you, Fergus. There's lots of love coming in for you, needless to say. One that we wanted to um, wrap things up on that actually came away a couple of days ago was uh, from Kevin Gary, saying that literally every tribute to you uh, by Leinster and Ireland players has highlighted how you were the hardest and toughest SOB on the pitch. Amazing reputation to leave uh, with, considering the animals that play the game. And uh, talking about loving to hear the stories and reasons behind it, which hopefully we've brought, uh, brought him a little bit of this morning. Enjoy retirement. Uh, best of luck over the next few weeks. Um, I hope everything is uh, safe and well on that front. And thanks for taking the call this morning. Cheers, lads. Take it easy. Thanks for having me. Fergus McFadden on the line there, uh, following his uh, announcement this week that uh, he's to retire from rugby. And uh, best of luck to him in whatever it is that come next, comes next. It's uh, 9 a.m. on this uh, Friday morning. We're delighted to have you along with us. You can keep your comments rolling into us here on the uh, YouTube channel, Facebook, wherever it is you're watching us this morning, Twitter, indeed, or, uh, or anywhere else. Um, and Darrow Tool has been in touch saying that Fergus McFadden uh, doesn't get enough credit for also being hilarious. His uh, tweet at Brian O'Driscoll's last game was one of the best tweets ever, which was uh, that standing ovation I got coming off the bench yesterday was amazing. Hashtag thanks. I think that was the one at the RDS where Brian went off after it was his final, 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 final game, I think, and um, he got injured. I think I seem to recall him limping off after 25 or 30 minutes. Um, so good stuff there from Fergus McFadden um, right we've lots more to come we've the uh, Mount Rushmore en route uh, with our Tipperary hats on so that's all coming your way in just a few moments a few moments time uh, our latest ought to be kids takeover by the way is with the Racing Metro star uh, Simon Zebo. it's brought to you in association with uh, Now TV and um, uh, and uh, you can stream every episode there of the unmissable uh, new show Gangs of London on the Now TV Entertainment Pass uh, which also has a 14-day free trial that you can avail of. So let's have a look at how Simon got on. The OTB Kids Takeover. Brought to you by Now TV. Keep the kids entertained with the Now TV Kids Pass. Hi, I'm Simon Zebo, and welcome to the OTB Kids Takeover. Hi, Simon. Do you think? Do you think your kids will be good at rugby? Like Brian O'Driscoll. Like Brian O'Driscoll. Brian. Oh. Oh. Just go. Bye. Yes, um, I do think my kids could be as good as Brian one day if they decide to play in um, the centre. You never know. But um, we prefer players like Ronan O'Gara and Paul O'Connell down our, our in our house. So um, hopefully they can be as good as them. Adam and Sarah, thank you for the question, but uh, no, I've found nothing in Paris that's better than Cork. Um, as you know, Cork is the best uh, place on earth, I, I think, actually. Um, Paris comes pretty close, but um, I'd say the, the weather would probably be the only thing you'd notice a little bit. We, we, we uh, have a tropical climate down in Cork, but Paris edges it a little bit. Well, good question, Josh. Yeah, um, there was plenty of times when I wasn't the fastest player in Munster. Um, Keith Earls would would definitely beat me in a race over a short distance. Doug Howlett used to smash me over uh, short distances. Um, 100 metres, though, I'd fancy my chances against anyone. Um, and, yeah, I've probably... Um, yeah, as long as I've been playing with Munster, uh, I would have been there or thereabouts in terms of the top speeds ever recorded. So, yeah. Aaron Limerick, um, tough question. Um, if I was the best players I've played, I, neither of them, to be honest, Aaron. Um, I'd probably pick Finn Russell over both of them, to be honest. Um, I'll uh, I'll plead the fifth on the on the Raj Johnny debate. 
Um, so yeah, I'll take Finn Russell on my dream team. Thank you. Hi, it's Joe Kinsley here from Ashburn Under 10s. Why did you need Munster to go and play for Ross in 92 if you knew that you'd lose your sp spot on the Irish international rugby team? Come on, Leinster. Good question, yeah. So I'd say the main reason would be just because um, I always wanted to play in France. So doing that was a, a big dream come true for me. Um, and obviously playing for Ireland was a big dream come true, but I'd already done that and um, I thought it was a good time for me to go. Good question though. Hi Sam and Ziva, I'm, I'm Milo Malone and I have a question for you. Who is your childhood icon and why in rugby? I had a few childhood heroes when I was young. I had um, Ronan O'Gara, Paul O'Connell, um, um, who else? Doug Howlett, all great players. Brian O'Driscoll even. Um, and yeah, I'd say my, my number one hero would have been Joe Rakatoko, who um, played for the All Blacks. He was a special player and I used to always pretend I was him uh, running with the ball when I was young. So I'd say Joe Rakatoko, yeah. Hi, my name is Ethan Onia. I play for Greystown's Rugby Club and Press Cubs. My question for you, Simon, is you always seem so positive. What's your key to being so happy, especially when you're disappointed or frustrated? Very good question. Yeah, I try to be as happy and as positive as I can um, every day. It's just, you know, I, I, I wake up and think I, I try to rather be happy than sad today. And if there's things that are, are getting me down or, you know, I'm upset about, for example, if you don't make a team or something like that, I just try and turn those things into a positive and say, it's an opportunity for me to get better and um, make it a challenge. And, and usually you come out with a, a positive result. Before a match, um, Jimmy, it depends. It, it varies, you know. Um, I, some days I could be in a, a tired mood and I might need lots of energy, lots of dance music or hip hop. Or some days I could be very relaxed or in a really good place mentally and I might listen to any music and, and some days, you know, I might, you know, need music to keep me awake. So it depends, you know, I, I've, I've varied all my music from um, Andrea Bocelli to Biggie Smalls, from Tupac back to Celine Dion, you know, there's a big mix, Bob Marley in there. Um, it's just however I feel on any given day, I, I uh, try and go out and take it as it is. I'm Mikey, I'm age nine and I play for Kilkenny Rugby Club. I want to ask you, who was the best player you played with in your career? Thank you, bye. Best player I've played with, I've played with a lot of great players. Um, even my hero, Joe Rakatoko, I played with. Um, but from, I think, an all-round talent um, base, I think it would be Vermi Vakatawa. Um, I think uh, I've never seen some of the things that he's able to do um, on a rugby pitch. He's very, 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 really good guy. Um, but in terms of his rugby ability, his passing, his stepping, try scoring, he's probably the best uh, player I've ever played with. Yeah. Hi, Connor. Um, best piece of advice I've ever received would be to always be yourself. Um, I know you probably hear it a lot, um, but for me that was very important. Um, when I was growing up, um, uh, and it stuck with me to this day, and, and it was my family, or pretty much every per member of my family, my close family, had to have a little sit down and tell me the same thing, and that was the best advice I've ever got. Hi, Simon. My name's Macy Bell, and what's your favourite TikTok dance? I'm too old for TikTok anyway for a start. I'm just trying to have a bit of fun. But my my um, favourite dance, um, I don't know if I have a favourite TikTok dance. Maybe, hmm, I don't know. I actually don't know. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Bonjour, Simon. My name is Patrick Sullivan from Cardline Rugby Club. I also play for Cardline United Soccer Team. My question for you is, when did you decide to pick rugby over soccer? Because I love both of them the same. And I know that I'm going to have to pick one of them one day. Thanks. Um, I think it's important to, to continue playing both until um, until you decide you, you like one or the, the other. Um, I played until I was maybe... 16 or 17, all, all the sports, hurling, football, soccer, um, athletics, etc. So, 
Yeah, rugby, rugby um, grew. Uh, my love for rugby grew faster than the others at that age. So um, that was the age for me. So hopefully um, you, you you make a good decision as well. But whatever you decide, if you go at it 100%, um, that's the best thing you can do. Thanks a million for your, all the questions, guys. Really appreciate it. Some tough ones in there, but um, we all worked out. Thanks again and see you soon. The OTB Kids Takeover. Brought to you by Now TV. Keep the kids entertained with the Now TV Kids Pass. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. The question ultimately is, you know, where do we go from here? I mean, where do we go from here? OTB Sports Radio. I drunk texted Joe Smith, too small Latin hebra. And he obviously just threw it into like Google Translate or something. Because he's like, ha, ah, thanks, Danny. Yeah, the first half was good, actually. <laughs> <laughs> now broadcasting 24 hours a day, live on the Go Loud app, Alexa. You have a whole new world of possibilities. Google Home, tune in, and off the ball.com slash radio. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB AM. All right, all right. It's uh, 10 past nine on this sunny Friday morning. Delighted to have you along with us here for OTB AM, the sports breakfast show from Off the Ball with you every weekday morning from half past seven right through until 10 o'clock. Do keep your comments coming into us. Lots still to come. We're going to put Tipperary through the ringer for the uh, latest Mount Rushmore, Alan Quinlan. Michael Quinlan going to make their picks there in just a few minutes' time. We've uh, also got Bar Wars coming your way. Owen has gone for uh, is it Dime or is it uh, Reese's Butternut uh, what are they called? Butter, <laughs> peanut butter cups. That's what they are. That's coming away in just a couple of moments' time as well. And the crappy quiz for myself, Tommy and Nathan. We'll go head to head to see uh, who's this week's champion. So that's all coming away. But right now it's time for uh, the very latest off the couch with uh, the Longford uh, footballer Mickey Quinn. Off the couch brought to you in association with Joint Days. Joint Days packed with trace minerals, vitamins, and nutrients to support a fit and healthy lifestyle at any age. You can check out jointace.com for more details on that. Mickey Quinn, good morning to you. Morning. How are things? How are you getting on? Good, good. Friday morning, lovely sunny day, so can't complain. You're um, you're back with us. You're a repeat offender uh, and off the couch. What have you? Uh, what are you bringing away a bit later on today? Um, just a bit of mix of trying to mix things up a little bit away from probably any sports specific stuff. So a bit of uh, juggling and tennis ball work. So some fun challenges there that are worth a try. Like even idiots like me could do is what you're saying. Oh yeah, hopes can try it. Might <laughs> be able to do them. But <laughs> um, lots of uh, lots going on, and people can keep an eye, by the way, on their social channels a little bit later on to um, to catch that. It'll be coming your way later on, and I'm I'm definitely after that challenge. I'm definitely going to be uh, tuning in for it. Um, obviously, lots up in the air, and plenty of stories doing their rounds this morning as well, making relation to the potential scrapping of. Championship 2020, one of the most interesting lines from the papers this morning was in the Irish News with Rory Gallagher, where he's saying that a lot of counties are now just viewing it as 2020 is gone. What's your um, what's your take on it? Look, it's probably dragged on um, from that side of things that trying to get a, a definite answer, is it's difficult and it's difficult for the GA and everyone to, to have that. But at the same time, it's nice to have that little bit of hope or a carrot there that's dangling f for people to to look forward to because it plays such a massive part. Um, but there's obviously bigger things at play and, and at stake, and I suppose that's that's the main thing that people can't can't forget. So look at if it needs to be put on hold or, or completely scrapped, and it's the right thing to do, then then so be it. But I think. GA probably have bought themselves some time now to to kind of see if it's vi vi viable to to play the 2020 championship in October. But um, to get back to some sort of normality is is all we want now at this stage. And and keeping that that bit of hope that the GA season could go ahead if that helps people in some shape or form, then so be it. It's interesting as well, looking across some of the back pages this morning, Mickey, you've got Liam O'Neill saying that he hopes a shutdown can be used to implement change in the Irish Times. On the back of the Irish Independent, Paddy Talley is saying this could be the shake-up the GEA has needed. That whatever happens, we do have a bit of time right now. There are GEA administrators who don't have any games to run off at the moment. If you're one of those administrators, Mickey, what are you using this time to achieve? Is there a possibility that there could be a few theories for what an ideal GEA calendar could look like? Yeah, definitely. I suppose when it comes to when there's long periods of time without games, the, 
the calendar season is, is the one thing that keeps cropping back up. But I suppose the way things are at the moment, it's probably definitely in the background um, of a lot of those guys' minds to, to be trying to think of something like that. They're probably thinking short term or this season and heading into next season, what's possible for the GA to do. Um, it, it does show that um, by if there are ways to condense a season to try and get them played off um, and rejigging things maybe a bit to to have the club before the, the count, inter-county season, if that is something that could work out. Um, but, you know, it's limiting the, the amount of pre-season and the number of training sessions, the games, is, is always the big thing. And you look at what they're doing in Benrell and, and in Australia and New Zealand with different sports there how you can condense the season and mm. I think that's that's the way forward if if we're looking at how how can the season be condensed to, to cater for all. That, that's exactly what Paddy Talley is actually saying this morning he's saying that there's no need for an inter-county season to be any longer than four or five months at most kind of like how they do it in the NFL and he's right because like the, the training to the games ratio is absolutely ridiculous we've got this brilliant condensed uh, format but it exists at the wrong time of the year like it just feels that what we're going to have now is I guess at the start of the year we had the, the conversation uh, about burnout which happens every single January we tend to enjoy the league and then come the summertime we will be having the conversation about championship structures and then there might be something else about the club player getting screwed over later on in the year it tends to go through a, a regular news cycle for the GEA so Perhaps instead of having these arguments uh, that are trashed out in the media quite a bit every summer, something like Paddy Talley's comments and your own comments could actually be looked at and thought about and perhaps saying to themselves, well, yeah, the inter-county training to games ratio is too high. We, we need to use this time to actually ensure that's not the case in 2021 or 22. Definitely. And I suppose probably when you look across the board um, at different sports and you see how how they, they play their seasons and... Do you know, there's a lot when it gets to that level or when you're talking at a senior level that playing games is a great way of improving and making the game a better a better spectacle and improving. Um, I suppose that's when you look at, you know, I suppose the only sport everyone's watching at the moment is The Last Dance um, with Michael Jordan and you're looking at games, so many games in a season and you're looking at the level that those players get to by playing games week in, week out and you learn from playing matches on a regular basis. You know, playing a game and waiting four or five weeks to go and train, and um, it doesn't exactly help things as much as playing week in, week out. And that's something that I'm probably seeing from a close side of things now that the long periods of uncertainty, um, it's it's so difficult for club players now. And I appreciate it more now than ever um, after probably see, having this stint. Mm. And even the product that it would lead to as well, Mickey, if you, if you mentioned like looking at great documentaries exactly. and great footage out there, like it feels that a, a lot of things happen and we actually kind of miss it as GEA fans, whether it's great club games that never see the light of day or Division 2 or 3 games, in, certainly in football, which are the most important divisions at the moment in football. And I, I, could, I couldn't, I, I maybe saw a couple of highlights of different games from Division 2 this year, but really that there's so much more to be tapped into, isn't there? Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, like some of the, I've saw clips of different games or scores or catches, points, and um, different bits and pieces from games. And I'm looking at them like, Jesus, that, I haven't seen it. And it was from this year's league. Or, um, and you just think, oh, if there's more games like that and more more things like that that's available and available for people to watch and see, um, it's just players are going to be getting better and spectators and everyone's going to be seeing a greater game. Uh, all right, Mickey, we're going to um, let you off for now. We're going to catch up with you again, obviously, at one o'clock. Thanks, Millie, for taking the call this morning. Thanks, Mill. Enjoy the Thanks challenge. Cheers, yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, get the tennis balls out for one o'clock is the uh, the short story here. Um, Mickey Quinn is going to take on the very latest uh, off the couch skills challenge and um, it's going to be an absolute humdinger as well. So uh, do keep an eye on that. And off the couch brought to you in association with Joint Ace. Joint Ace packed with trace minerals, vitamins, nutrients to support fit and healthy lifestyle at any age. And you can check out jointace.com uh, for more details on all of that. So that's coming your way. It's one o'clock across off the ball social channels and uh, be prepped and be ready.
because it's an off the couch with a bit of a difference. So it's uh, OTB AM on this Friday morning, 9.18. Delighted to have you along with us. It's the Sports Breakfast Show from Off the Ball. 87 180 if you want to get in contact with us this morning. We've the Tipperary Mount Rushmore on the way, the Crabby Quiz on the way. So we're steeled and ready for all of that. But before that, it's the important business. Bar Wars is back. It's Dime Bar versus Reese's Cups. This week on Bar Wars, it is the battle of the underrated substances. The criminally underrated Dime up against the mischievously underrated Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. All right, we're starting with the Dime Bar straight out of Sweden, a country, of course, who haven't locked down due to coronavirus. Clearly, the reasoning for that was that they could keep exporting these to us. And as an expert in epidemiology, I can say correct call Sweden. So we'll give this a rating out of 100. The Dime Bar is amazing. Anybody who says otherwise either A, just doesn't know what they're talking about, or B, uses this stupid excuse about their teeth. That, like, it hurts their teeth and gets stuck in their teeth, eating the dime bar, and your teeth are sensitive, or you feel damaged, or you feel like your fittings are getting pulled out by the dime bar. Go get some better teeth. Do not attack the bar for your own failings in enamel. Like, it's even fun to eat. Like, when you're chewing on it, feels like in your head you're listening to rainforest sounds or something of that description. There's just so much going on in your head as you feel your teeth crunching up against one another and destroying themselves in here. Such a good bar. I don't understand why people complain about it. It's just such an easy target because it's not one of our own. Like we're very good to point fingers in this country and say, oh, look at the Swedish bar over here. Not as good as our own. Not as good as a Cadbury's Dairy Milk, is it? Well, it is. It's better than a Cadbury's Dairy Milk, I'll have you know. This is an 87%. On to Reese's and a peanut butter cup. Let's just get one thing straight here, because I know what's coming here. I, I know that I'm going to bite into a chocolate substance and there will be peanut butter on the inside. Some of you at home will be sitting there in your ivory tower, looking at people trying things out with their chocolate, you know, shooting their shot, thinking to themselves, should I put peanut butter into a chocolate cup? You're thinking to yourself, God, don't try that. Frowning upon what Reese's have tried here. That is, Pure Irish begrudgery, thinking that someone should not try putting peanut butter into chocolate. Because I'll tell you what, it works. So we've got three little peanut butter cups in here. I don't see how people think that this is a bad idea, putting peanut butter in with chocolate. <clears throat> I don't see how anybody thinks that it is a bad idea, putting peanut butter in with chocolate. For those of you who think that it just shouldn't be done, live a little. Go put some pineapple onto your pizza. It works. I mean, people who say pineapple doesn't work on pizza, trying to be hip and cool, I get it. Don't worry, we all have an image to uphold. Peanut butter in a chocolate, I get it. It's not cool to like it. And peanut butter is actually good for you, which I think we sometimes forget. Like, I'm just looking up some of the health benefits of peanut butter here. It's got protein. It's got magnesium. It's got phosphorus. It's got zinc. It's got niacin. It's got vitamin B6, taste of vitamin B6 in here actually. It helps with weight loss, boosting heart health, bodybuilding. So, a score. I did struggle to breathe a little bit while eating that, so probably not a good sign. I'm gonna give it a, a 78%. I'm sorry, I would like to make it a bit closer than that, but it's not. Dime Bear wins. Like I'm sure everybody will be hopping on saying, you know, Dime is terrible and Reese's is terrible. That's what you're trained to think. That's what you're conditioned to think. We need to start teaching some independent critical thinking in our schools so that people can wake up to the realization that the dime bar is absolutely gorgeous. OTB's Mount Rushmore. Yes, OTB Mount uh, Rushmore coming your way. Plenty of interaction post Bar Wars, by the way. We'll bring that your way a little bit later on. But uh, delighted to say Tipperary are uh, sharpening their pencils and their picks and whatever else it is that it takes to get this thing done. And uh, Chief Selector this morning, delighted to say Alan Quinlan, come on in. Good morning, Adrian. How are you? We're going to be joined uh, by uh, Michael Quinlan, I think is on the line as well. Good morning to you, Michael. Hi, Adrian. How are things? Flying the thanks, yeah. I mean, um, I've been through this. Last week, it's not easy. Quinny, are you how are you feeling? Yeah, I, I was um, 
unsure of this. Uh, obviously, when you uh, you can rattle off a few names in your head, but then when you actually go and do a bit of exploring, there's there's lots of candidates to and lots of successful sports people in Tipperary. I think uh, Tipperary as a county is is probably best known for its GA stars, hurling and football, and camogie and ladies footballers as well. So. Uh, Horse racing as well, for sure. Um, mm. So it's uh, it's an interesting one, but yeah, we have a lot of sports stars and uh, hopefully we can find a couple to make the list. Yeah, well, we've about 20 minutes to get into it. So without further ado, what, the way we're going to work here, by the way, people will be familiar with it at this stage, but you're going to make your four selections, uh, Quinny, after which Michael will have the opportunity to come in and nix one of them out at the expense of uh, one of the people that he feels actually should be up there. And you can debate around it, uh, the rights and wrongs of that, and come to some sort of a temporary conclusion at the end of it. But you might kick us off, if you if you don't mind, by giving us maybe a sense of some of the runners and riders and your first couple of picks. The runners and riders. Well, as I said, that uh, you could pick loads of hurlers, um, you know, people that I... I I uh, remember going to Tipperary hurling matches back in the, the 80s, 90s. Um, Tipperary won two All-Irelands. Uh, 89 and 91 and uh, that team you know was dominated by Nicky English Pat Fox Joe Hayes Bobby Ryan Richard Stakelham all these guys John Lahey, Um they were all superstars in my eyes and uh, I think the one I've if I'm picking one from hurling you could obviously go back um, a number of of years before that back to the 40s 50s 60s 70s, um, Tipperary were very, very successful in hurling and Jimmy Doyle and John Doyle are two that um, are kind of star names to pick out. John Doyle won eight All-Irelands for, for Tipperary and 10 Munster titles, 10 National League titles. Nobody's ever won more National League titles. Henry Shefflin passed him out for the All-Ireland. So John Doyle is obviously um, you know, a superstar uh, he was a superstar hurler and uh, played for 17 years, I think, is at, at, for the county. So that was incredible. And Jimmy Doyle, the same, um, six All-Irelands. So there's loads of them. He was inducted into the GA Hall of Fame. So, I, so a part of this, Adrian, feels like I'm disrespecting other sports people. Um, but the person I picked from hurling is Nicky English because, uh, you know, Nicky is the one that, you know, I, I saw up close and personal. Um I was obsessed with Tipperary hurling. I still am. And I went to so many league matches, club matches, inter-county championship matches. And, you know, Nicky, Nicky taught me in school as well. So maybe I'm a bit biased. I'll get accused of that again this week, like the Sex and O'Gara thing last week. Um, <laughs> but uh, Nicky to us was God. That was his nickname. He was God. Um, I just think he was gifted. And um, he'd six All-Stars. Only two All-Irelands. That's probably the biggest disappointment for that team that under Babs Keaton in, in 87, won the, you know, their first Munster title in a very, very long time. And then there's an incredibly good bunch of players there and they probably should have won more than two All-Irelands. But uh, Nicky was just a superstar in our eyes and he's the one I'm picking from from Hurley. You, you had me convinced that the way you were going there, John Doyle was the, the man to go up. Yeah, um, and yeah, it's a bit disrespectful um, probably to John Doyle. But look, it's... You're, I think uh, in a different, as I said, Nicky, you could argue the All-Irelands probably should sway John Dial's uh, um, favour. but And obviously, if I was picking two hurlers, I would pick John Dial and Nicky English. And maybe maybe Michael might change that and say he's deserving to be in there. But the reason I'm picking Nicky is because I was there to see it firsthand. And I just saw, I think he was one of the most gifted hurlers that ever played the game. And he had an incredible talents and and ability to just do stuff off the cuff and and that's why I'm picking him. Yeah, definitely had uh, cut through beyond Tipperary for sure as well. So that's the first phase we can start getting our uh, our etcher busy on the mountain. Quinny, who who where are you going for with your uh, second pick? Well, I won't go into as much detail. I'll try. I, I, what I'll do is I'll just name them and then we can debate them. Um, in soccer, I, I, there's a bit of a... I, I kind of went for a couple of different sports here because I didn't want to go top-heavy in one. As I said at the start, you could in GA, particularly when it comes to Tipperary as a county. Um, I went for Shane Long in the soccer. Again, somebody I I, I know very well. I think he's... Um, and it just... Because of, of the difficulty in going and playing in Premier League and being a professional footballer and playing at the top level and 
not many get the, the chance to experience that, particularly from from maybe outside of Dublin. Um, obviously, there's loads of exceptions, so I, 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 I stand to be corrected on that. But for Tipperary to have someone who's played um, 82 times for their country um, and gone on to... You know, he played for my local soccer club as well in St. Michael's in Tipperary. I played, believe it or not, was an average soccer player, but I loved, I loved playing well, believe soccer it, as Willie. well. Um, I was deadly from about two yards. I was a striker uh, <laughs> or a goalkeeper. So I was at both ends of the field or else on the bench. Um, but Shane Long was, uh, for what he's achieved, I think, I just think it's very difficult to, for me not to pick him. Again, watching him up close and seeing him and knowing his story, where he's come from. And uh, he played minor hurling for Tipperary as well. So he was a very talented hurler as well. So um, I'm It seems ridiculous for somebody with, with 80 odd caps to be saying this, but like he didn't achieve, I don't think, what people might have expected of him. Like the, that level of consistency wasn't there in terms of scores. Like we yeah. mentioned, obviously there were, there were moments there of unbelievable, like the Germany goal. Um, but probably didn't eke out maybe as much as I assume that he himself would have uh, would have liked. Yeah, well, you could argue that like he wasn't a superstar uh, player, um, but I think um, the competitiveness and the difficulty and the challenges of playing in the Premier League and he's, um, you know, he's been around a long time and certainly probably could have scored more goals by his own admission. But, you know, we don't have too many soccer players that we can boast about um, who've achieved um, what he's achieved. So to play for your country 82 times, and and as you say, it's, it's very valid to say that you know you would have, you'd love to have a Robbie Keane type scenario with Shane Long because I think he certainly showed glimpses of his brilliance over the years, but probably um, didn't kick on to score those goals that that he would have loved and everybody would have loved. But it's still an incredible achievement to to do what he has he has done really in in uh, you know coming from a rural part of Tipperary. Yeah, so that's the. Um, I mean, I feel less confident that he, he might be there at the end, but we'll see how we get on in the next little while. We'll tell all our um, tell our, our guy to hold off on him for the minute. So that's your second pick, Quinny. Where are you going after that? I'm going to rugby, my own sport, and uh, surprisingly, Adrian, I know you'd be shocked with this. I'm not picking myself. Um, I'm picking uh, a former teammate, Dennis Leamy, who. Uh, his career was cut short with a horrendous hip injury. He's had to have a hip replacement after he retired in in 2012. Um, I just think he was an incredible talent. Um, he was a brilliant teammate. He was a monster on the field, incredibly tough, resilient, someone that you would, without hesitation, um, go to battle with and, and love to be beside you when you're, when you're playing in tough games in the south of France or playing in New Zealand. Um, I think he was just very unlucky with some of the injuries. He had two knee, knee reconstructions throughout his career uh, and then that hip injury towards the tail end of it, you know, and had to retire at 29. So I think he was very unlucky um, mm. not to be picked in the Lions Tour in 2009. I think that would have really uh, been deserving. I got picked. Um, we know the story, what happened after that. But I think Dennis was an incredible player, um, so talented, and as tough as nails. And I just think, you know, to have 57 caps um, with the injuries and the early retirement, I think he would have definitely went on to, to get close to 80, 90, 100 maybe. And, um, but I think he was what he's achieved and uh, representing Tipperary, Munster, Ireland. Um, I think it's been second to none. And as again, you know, I, I do stand corrected on all these decisions and, and these picks that I have but I think what swayed me with some of them is obviously just the knowledge of the person the uh, the attitude and you could argue about you know winning things and trophies and medals um, should dictate it but um, I just think Dennis was a superstar. Dunica Ryan obviously has gone on to achieve a huge amount as well. Uh, Tommy O'Donnell, Trevor Hogan uh, the Fogarty's from Cashel, so we've we've had a lot of um, really good rugby players, and and in the last number of years, and uh, I just think Dennis deserves to be mentioned when you're talking about top Tipperary sports people. Yeah, for what it's worth, I was saying at the top of the show, you should people are going to forget who actually selected these, and you should have just gone ahead and put yourself in there. No, no, I, uh, I'm not ahead of Dennis Leamy, and I'd be very, I'd be very uh, straight up about that. I just think Dennis was. 
Um, you know, I could argue, I, I could argue some of my own failings and and being a bit unlucky at times with injuries, which I was. But um, you know, I just I wouldn't be comfortable uh, putting myself in in that situation. Obviously, if I went on to win eighty or ninety caps, and you know, you I went in the lines and won Grand Slams and all that kind of stuff. Played in them. Um, I have a medal from all nine, but I didn't play in it. So Dennis is different, you know. I think he's he was part, and you know he's part of a competitive uh, and an incredible array of talent in the back row throughout my career and and throughout his career as well. And I just remember when he okay. came on, when he came on the scene first with Monster. I'll just give you one quick story. Yeah. I, John Hayes and myself were around for a little while, and we looked at Leamy and we went. I just immediately went. He's going to make it. He's going to be a superstar, and and he was. Okay. What's who's the fourth? Um, I I just think you can't you can't go you can't talk about Tipperary you can talk you can't talk about Tipperary without talking about hurling and horse racing. Um, I think um, the the interest the passion uh, around horse racing is just phenomenal. I think Mick Mick Canan has just achieved so much in the game. He was there for thirty four years at the top. Won won all the top races. Um, incredible longevity. Um, I think he has to be in the in in the four that I'm picking. I think Charlie Swan obviously had a brilliant career as a jockey as well, and he's famously renowned for for the great races on Isterbrack and the wins on Isterbrack. So, um, if I'm, if we're going into horse racing, it has to be Mick Canan. Someone actually texted me this morning. They're my four, but somebody said, uh, uh, "What about Sean Kelly?" And uh, Michael probably know better living in Clonmel, but. From my understanding, Sean Kelly, the cyclist, he, he claims to be a Waterford man. Is that correct? Yeah, ah, sure. Listen to him Smith. talk. Car- Carrick is a contentious area in the <laughs> fact that you have three county borders culminating in one town. But I think he is originally from out past the golf club, which is County Waterford. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I imagine he'll be high up on the list of Waterford candidates when that certainly comes around. Yeah, he would be for sure. So they're my four. Uh, okay. Nicky English, Shane Long. Dennis Leamy and Mick Canan. Okay, okay. Right, I know there's a bit of chopping and changing that over the last little while and uh, as you said, the, the sweaty palms kicked in. Michael, from your own point of view, uh, how has this process been for you? Um, it's incredibly difficult. Like, I, I had my mind made up last night and I'm still thinking about changing it this morning. Um, it's it's very you, difficult. Are, I probably... I are went you at odds with Quinny there on that? Uh, yeah, I, I do agree. I, I did agree on, on two of the selections. Um, I suppose I'll, I'll give a bit of background. I kind of tried to put my own criteria on it. Um, I took Mount Rushmore to mean that it was past presidents or, you know, people who had completed their full term in office, which meant that anybody who was currently playing, I left out, mainly because it's hard to get a grasp on a full career while they're still playing. Um, you use that as a combat. That that's is, we 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 understand. That's that's uh, that's fine. Yeah. So the main the main one to lose out there, which Quinny has mentioned, is Shane Long. Um, okay. Given the fact that he's still playing, um, but even there's you know some of the contingent that are currently with the Tipperary Senior Hurling team, I'd say in five to ten years' time would have a serious shout of being in on this as well. Um, and even past that, you know, like Joseph O'Brien is still training. I think. He, if he continues on his current current trajectory, could definitely stake a claim in the coming years as well. And a, after that, then um, the thing that I tried to do was maybe have a think about how I viewed sport in Tipperary. Um, the predominant and certainly most popular by a country mile is hurling, um, and. For the vast majority of people in Tipperary, hurling is is to be all and end all. And taking that into account, I said in my head certainly that there was there should be two places for two hurlers on this. You could argue, I think you'd still be here in the morning arguing if you were try, trying to pick four to go up. Um, but even trying to narrow it down to two, and Quinny's mentioned, you know, a lot of them there already. It's incredibly difficult. So I had I had put Nicky English into my team. Um, now the thing for me is I don't really have a reference point for either of the two dials because unfortunately you know it's a it's a fair bit before my time 
Um, yeah. I think Owen Kelly has a serious show to go in there in, in recent years. It, it, he, he was a wizard pretty much with a, with a hurling stick, but I know... So are, are, you, you, are know you going hurling. for Kelly, Kelly and English? Um, I had them originally in, but I'm finding it very difficult to maybe look past John Doyle. Um, you know, that that era of Tipperary hurling was is the pinnacle. Um, they would have been in my team... I, I but I'll stick to my guns and I'll I'll put in Owen Kelly mainly because of you know my generation he was you talked about God and, and Owen Kelly is the son of God so like they would be the two for me. Um, okay. so after that, I, Ke- I, Kelly English, yeah. Yeah. After that, I had um, I had also put in Mick Canan. Um, I think I think you're you know Coolmore is. And Bally Doyle are the they're they're the cream of the crop when it comes to horse racing internationally. Um and to be honest, the fact that Aidan O'Brien maybe wasn't in the Wexford one uh was a bit mad because he, of what he's done in the horse racing game over the last few years. Um we obviously you couldn't pick Vincent O'Brien because he would have been, you know, unfortunately born in Cork, but maybe made in Tipperary. Um so I, I, I definitely agree with the Mick Canan one. Um, you know, it culminated in an unbelievable final year with Sea the Stars in 2009 as well. Um, so he was the other one. And and my la- the way I viewed the, the last uh, spot within Tipperary is you, you find you find different pockets within the county um, for soccer, for rugby, for Gaelic football, um, and. It, if it, I think it, for me personally, um, I'd have to have Declan Brown in there. Um, he elevated Tipperary football to a level that was unheard of before he came along. Two All Stars, international rules, honours, um, and and the biggest thing that stands out for me about Declan is the fact that in every corner of Ireland, regardless of whether they know anything about Tipperary football, they all know him, regardless. You know, and they're all able to to really off help. Um, so they were my four. I I know full well that I've I'm bringing a huge recency bias to all this, and certainly more of a, a South Tipperary bias as well, considering that there's no one past Turles on my team. Um, you could easily break the county up into two and still have a massive argument over this. Um, and I think the fact that. I, I still do think that John John Doyle and Jimmy Doyle. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm just not a bit older, and I don't have a, I don't have a a reference to their time in a Tipperary jersey compared to what I yeah. do with the other two, and yeah, that's well, I, why I, I have. To I would urge, um, for what it's worth, against recency bias. But listen, it's not my Mount Rushmore, so it's up to you guys. Uh, John Shee, he's been in touch on YouTube, uh, saying that Quinny doesn't have Jimmy Doyle in his top two hurlers. Question mark. He's not happy with you, and I'm sure the uh, rancor over this will continue for a while as well. So just to recap on exactly where we're at, lads. Right, Alan Quinlan for his four has gone for uh, Shane Long, Nicky English, Mick Canan, and Dennis Leamy, and then Michael for his four has gone for also Nicky English and also Mick Canan. But he's got Owen Kelly in there, and he's got Declan Brown. Uh, we're right on all that. Correct, yeah. Okay, so let the debate begin, I suppose. There's two up for grabs here. Uh, Dennis Leamy and Chen Long is not in um, Michael's list there, Quinny, and he's proposing uh, Declan Brown and, and Owen Kelly instead. Just let the debate begin. I did. It's very, very difficult. Like, uh, uh, and... I, I can completely understand where Quinny has come from because, you know, you've had personal experience with most of the people who are, are in your list. Um, that, should, that, that, that shouldn't sway completely either because yeah. um, it's, not, um, it's not, I wouldn't be digging my heels in on any of these because I genuinely feel um, that you're kind of, are you disrespecting people who have done incredible things in their own sport and stuff. And there's so many more, like you said, Michael, the current hurlers, Brendan Cummins, Seamus Callanan, Noel McGrath, uh, the Mahers, Tommy Dunn, someone, I remember Tommy Dunn, I remember playing a hurling match for my school one time, uh, the Abbey CBS against Tommy, uh, Tommy School and Tommy Vara, and he scored 4-10 in the match. And <laughs> I remember thinking, 
where is this? This is phenomenal. Like I'm on the other end of the field, and Tommy Dunn is, and I couldn't do anything about it. And uh, he was just extraordinary hurler, and uh, you know, Lark Corbett, Owen Kelly. These are guys I wrote down last night when I was kind of thinking about it. And there's so many more you could put into that um, that, that category, and and. I think yeah. every, everyone's going to debate this and, um, yeah. you know, th- there's no f- right or wrong answer, really. I think we just probably have to settle. I do agree with Declan Brown as well. I I, I wrote Declan's name down, um, you know, in a very, very barren period for Tipperary football. As you say, Michael, um, he was just a superstar and he shouldn't be judged on what he didn't win. Uh people continuously said if Declan Brown went to Kerry or Dublin or Tyrone or some other county he could have numerous All-Irelands because he could have made those teams so much better he was just a genius deserves a mention Owen Kelly is someone the reason I probably didn't go for Owen um, because I'm kind of putting him in with Nicky as you say Owen was baby God and and Nicky was God Um, so look there's there's loads of different debates on it and and I do understand uh, the Shane Long one so I'm, I'm happy I'm going to let you make the changes, Michael, because um, well, bef- I, I could... before before you do anything else, before we take another step, we do want to hear a last pitch in just a moment. And before that, we've had Dennis Vahey, who's been in touch on YouTube and on. I'm going to ask you to jump in here because um, he is wondering why there's no Lena Rice on this. And there's a couple of names that you mentioned at the very top of the show at half past seven this morning that we haven't discussed just yet. Right, I was just making it the, the point at the top of the show, lads, that there's an unbelievably rich history when it comes to Tipperary sports people. But I guess... Like, I think that if you've got recency bias to go on or if you've got recent uh, sports stars that you actually remember playing or that you can see in colour television playing, I think you always have to go for them. But just Bob Tisdall and his amazing performance in the Los Angeles Olympic Games uh, has to go in there. I, I don't think he'd run much 400-metre hurdles up until those Olympic Games and actually wins the gold medal uh, on the same day that Dr. Pat O'Callaghan won uh, a couple, I think, of his gold medals, or at least one of them. You've got Tom Kiley, the gold medalist from 1904, and then you've got Lena Rice as well, who's been mentioned there, uh, the first and only Irish woman to win the Wimbledon uh, singles. Uh, Marl Hill House is uh, where she grew up, so uh, from a fairly well-to-do family, uh, but obviously going well back into Irish society there. Those three names uh, have uh, have come up and have been mentioned. But like it's it's a tight one. Like Michael, I just want to briefly ask you on Declan Brown because it's it's a great suggestion. Like the the counterpoint that a lot of people will make, and I'm not. I, I promise I won't put you in the awkward position of ever considering yourself for, for the Mount Rushmore, but the 2016 and the the All-Ireland uh, semi-final aspects uh, of that, like, does that perhaps bring that Tipperary football team up to the Declan Brown team's level, or do you think that Declan Brown almost paved the way so that some of the, the great footballers who would come under Liam Kearns would be able to, to reach the heights that they did? Uh, I think he was the catalyst for mm. a lot of that. He, he made football very popular... You know, and he made it a, a worthwhile, a worthwhile game to play. Um, I don't think any of what happened in in those years compared to what he did as a player, um, and the level he took football in Tipperary to. Um, personally, I, I just I, he was he was a genius. He was a genius, and and that's why he he would have to make my list. I suppose look, just a couple of other ones, like Ali Cal had an unbelievable League of Ireland career. Played in Europe nine nine years in a row for four different clubs and won five league titles. Like there's another one, and obviously fondly remembered in Clamell. I, I played against I played against him, Michael, as well. Would you believe it? <laughs> yeah, uh, loads. And 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 I saw him playing for Clamell Town so many times against St Michael's. Phenomenal, left yeah. peg in him, brilliant pace. He he was he was brilliant. Um, and then the other one, look with the year that's in it. You know, if you're talking about sporting notoriety, like. It's 100 years since Bloody Sunday and Michael Hogan would have to get a mention in there as well. Mm. You know, that's... It, it's it's incredibly difficult. Like, we've had 20 minutes here and I, I could probably still go on for another hour and name it out yeah. different players and different people. It's it's really difficult. But if if I have to hang my hat on someone and given my background, I have to put Declan Brown into that team. Well, um, there is one last pitch, I, I, I one last pitch we, want, we want to hear from uh, Michael just before you put that to, uh, to the man himself. Um, some interesting names mentioned there by Owen but one other last pitch has come through from our own Dahi Boland take a look I do not envy Quinny and Michael here one bit but there is one man who has to be on the Premier County Mount Rushmore that man being a certain John Doyle 
from Holy Cross. You cannot, cannot have a Tipperary Mount Rushmore without a man who has won eight Lean McCarthy's, 10 Munster Championships, 11 National League titles. Nobody has won more National League titles than John Doyle. He made 54 championship appearances in his 19 years wearing the blue and gold. Finished every game he started. Named Hurler of the Year in 1964. Named cornerback on Team of the Century. Named cornerback on Team of the Millennium. Ladies and gentlemen, do I need to say much more? Like, if you had a 99 ice cream cone without a flake on it, it would not be right. If you have a Tipperary Mount Rushmore without John Doyle, it would not be right. John Doyle has to be on the Tipperary Mount Rushmore. 99 without a flake, lads. Um... Yeah, right. I agree with him. I, I, he swayed me because uh, I, I was split between getting John Dial in there last night. The reason I kind of went for the four different sports was just to give it a bit of variety. Um, and I do. So, think are you John changing Dial your four? Quick... Him up. Pardon? Are you changing your four now before we get Michael to make his his addition? No, I just I'm just telling Michael to put John Dial in. <laughs> <laughs> right. The four as it stands are Quinny's four of Long, English, Canaan and Leamy. Michael, you get one change. What are you looking at? You put me in a horrible, horrible <laughs> position here. You know that. Because, like, I mean... I, oh, just back, back your gut here, Michael, not your head. It's You have so, to go with the, the tummy here, not the head. What you feel, you have to go. You could put all, any of them in. Don't be swayed by that. Am I allowed to put one in and offer Quinny that he can change one of his ones? You you can debate it out as you want. That's... But but who try me, who, who, try me anyway, Michael. I might you, do. You it have your forward there, Michael. Who do, who do you really want to get on? That's the question. I have to put Declan Brown into it. I, okay. For me, I have to. Um, and I who, who would you? You Who know, would you be suggesting to take out? Uh, I already I've agreed on the two, so you, I'm left with either Shane Long or Dennis Leamy. Um, and if I stay true to my criteria, which was the fact that anybody who's still playing, you know, I didn't look at them, then I'd have to remove Shane Long. Jeez, I feel terrible even saying these things. But that's your excuse when you meet him anyway. Now you can say, look, you're, you're, you're still playing. But anyway. It's all right. You can etch over, you can etch over someone now. You have the chance to change. There you go. Tahi has made his case. You, you, you can swap him uh, out for any of the others, uh, Quinny, if you wish. Declan Brown is going up. You can still... It doesn't have to be Shane Long. Oh, Lord. Right, so he's putting in Declan Brown. So we're going... Uh, I, I think we could say that Nick English and Mick Canan are on. Declan Brown is now going on, and you have a straight call between um, Long or Leamy. Or if you want to put John Doyle or you want to make any last changes, you got to speak now. Yeah, if I change Mick Canan, I get lambasted from the, the, the racing fraternity. Um, <laughs> and I think, look, for what he's achieved, it's, it's, it's very difficult not to, it's impossible not to have him in there. Um, Don't worry about who's lambasting you. Yeah. Um, right, so I, I'll go Nicky English, John Dial, Dennis Levy, and he's allowed to put Declan Brown in then, so I'm taking Mick Canaan out. <laughs> Canaan is out. Oh, Jesus. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, how, how was pulling that plaster off? It's that's it, It's a tough one, but... I, I think that you've resulted in something there that's that's a, a good-looking Mount Rushmore anyway. It's like somebody was always going to miss out with the names that you listed off there. So, Can, can we put five in? <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised the amount of time that comes up. Just so we're absolutely certain of where we're landing here. We have Nicky English, we have John Doyle, we have Declan Brown, and we have Dennis Leamy. Is that right? If I take Dennis out, then, well, uh, really, I've got to put Mick Canaan back in. So that's what I'm, I'm, I'm at now. 
All right, he won't be texting me anyway. <laughs> would, no. you ra- would you rather be public en- enemy number one of the racing fraternity no, or is it Dennis Leamy fraternity? No, do you know what? Um, and, and, and is it settled on this then? Is it my, I have the final call of I? Absolutely. Oh, Jesus. Michael, you, you, you cop out there. Uh, so I, 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 I don't want to let Declan Brown in then. And, but you I can't, can't. You have no, you have no I'm choice really, if, if, if no he's choice. putting him forward. That's, that's, that sounds terrible because on, uh, Declan, as I said, was incredible. Um, oh, Jesus. I think you know it's a great stick, shoot out I'm here sticking, by the looks of things. I'm, st- I'm, I'm sticking with what I have. Um, um, I'm going to go Nicky English, um, Den- Dennis John. Leamy, Mick Canan, and Declan Brown. That's Doyle's five. Gonna kill me and all the no, Doyle's, John Doyle is gone. Then is what you're saying. No, 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 no. no Doyle is in it. It's it's Canan that's missing out. The one that you went for a, mo- a moment ago. So it sounded like you had a perfect agreement with Michael as well, Quinny. For 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 English, Leamy, Doyle, and Brown. That did seem like the best list to me, lads. I'm not going to lie to you. Leamy, English, Doyle, and Brown is what I certainly saw as the the happy medium between your two. But ju- just confirm you're happy with that. Are you picking it on? Or am I picking it? Right, lads, come on. We need to move you to a conclusion here. It's it's a shootout between, as I see it, uh, Mick Canaan. I agree with Nicky. I agree with John Doyle, and I agree with Declan Brown. But I think Mick Canaan has to win. I think right. we'll, we'll settle on those four. I blame you, so, Michael. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> no Tell problem. us who we have here because Stay I saw so many listing up my on my bit of paper here. Who we actually ended up with? Oh Jesus. <laughs> Um, Nick, Nicky, Nicky English, John Dial, Declan Brown, and Mick Canan. So Michael has taken out Dennis Leamy and Shane Long. He's taken the blame. For that. He hasn't. He hasn't. <laughs> I think. Okay. You can never fought uh, their case. Listen, I think that's a strong list, lads. I think that that fourth spot between Canaan, Leamy, Long probably could have gone either way, really, but it's ended up in Mick Canan's corner, and that's where the jury ends. More stressful than you expected? Definitely, yeah. Where, where is it going, lads? What whereabouts and tip is it being etched? Uh, under the rock of cash. Sounds under like it's it, good a, you, sounds like <laughs> good a shout as any. <laughs> like, <laughs> properly under it or uh, somewhere where people can see it. Nice cliff face under the rock of cash that would take right. a lovely little temporary around Mushroom. Very go. good, very good, very good. You can agree on that, Quinny? Absolutely, no problem with that. Good. Well, listen, you did. Uh, you played a blinder. Thanks for um, putting the hours in over the last couple of days and uh, well presented. Well done, lads. Uh, should I put Michael in before we finish? <laughs> <laughs> List closed. He's begun. Cheers, lads. He's got his pick out. Thanks, Good on you. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Michael Quinlan and Alan Quinlan there picking their temporary Mount Rushmore. Much ranker, as you might have expected. And uh, I'm sure the debate will go on online as well. We do really want to get you uh, involved too. So if you have any thoughts about um, who should have been in or out, please do feel free to get in touch with us as well. But uh, that is the final four. English, Doyle, Canaan and uh, Brown is the way that wrapped up. Right, that is a, that for the minute. Uh, that is uh, the Tiberi Mount Rushmore. OTB AM's Mount Rushmore. All right, it's just before uh, 10 a.m. on this Friday morning. You've been watching on Virgin Media Sport uh, this morning. Delighted to have had you along with us. That's it from uh, us for you uh, for this morning. Rejoin us again on Monday at half past seven. Uh, half past seven and check out offtheball.com as well for more. So Virgin Media Sport viewers, uh, good morning to you. And for those of you watching on Off The Ball, plenty more still to come. We promised you a crappy quiz. That's on the way after these. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Off The Ball. But when I got to Liverpool, I thought, right, I've, I bought myself a nice Aston Martin. I pulled up on the lights alongside Roy Keane, of all people, and uh, I had the shades on. I think I was listening to some Speed Garage. My arm was out the window. Um, you know, I was having myself. Uh, and then Roy, Roy gave me that look that uh, he's given many a people in his in his time. And um, as he sped off into the distance, I was sitting in this car, I looked at myself in the mirror and thought, I need to get rid of this. Off the ball. Weeknights from seven and weekends from one. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB AM. On OTB Sports Radio. Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Chris Martin. Oh, you're kidding me. 
September. Kyle Lafferty. Are you joking me? Is that right? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome along to the shadiest segment on Irish Radio. It's the scintillating, it's the stupefying, it's the spendido crappy quiz. Every Friday, we pit three of team off the ball up against each other in a no-holes-barred quiz of sporting factoids at the end of the week. Allow me to welcome today's contestants. Our first contestant is public enemy number one in John Aldridge's house after scraping his face off the Westmeath Mount Rushmore last week. What did he do to be removed from such a position after two years of doing literally nothing wrong? Perhaps we'll never know. Give it up for Adrian, who's your daddy, Barry? Dan MacDonald did make the point on the show on Saturday that actually I missed out on an even more significant former um, football international. Which is? Jose Luis Brown. Of course, yeah, that. I hadn't really think of, of Jose. Uh, what, what well, it's a bit like Zorro. Where, where was Zorro from? Was it Wexford or Zorro? How do you pronounce it? Zorro. Was it Wexford? Yeah, I think Wexford. Yeah, Zorro's from Wexford. So there you go, Jose uh, missed out. So you'd have Jose ahead of John Aldridge. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> I would. Who, like, as it turns who is out, Jose? John Aldridge was not really in the top, top 10. Uh, Argentina World Cup winner in 1986. Turns out he was from uh, Westmead somewhere. I've, oh, yeah? I've, I've Googled it. I've, did, I've applied the um, Mount Rushmore research and Googled it, and I can't find any actual evidence for it, but Dan was um, suggesting it might be the case. Our next contestant today... So you're backtracking on your Mount Rushmore? Oh. You're accepting you probably got it wrong? No, no, pal. There is really... I mean, tell me, as the per- person who's running all this, and at some point you're going to have to redo Mayo with somebody who's actually bothered to investigate it. Look, there is no right or wrong answer in the Mount Rushmore, as long as everybody's having fun. Uh, our exactly. next contestant just, today I, I, has got his half and half jersey ready. It's one side France, one side Portugal. After last week's success, he's the number one fan of Portu France. It's the very much disputed champion of the crappy quiz, Nathan <laughs> Nate Dog Murphy. Poor France, I think you'll find. Poor France. I watched no, the back. You, boys, you, you were boys in the right. are a disgrace. No, I watched the back. You were right, Nathan. Thank you. Congratulations nah, again. that's bollocks. Oh, come on. You let yourself nothing down. nothing worse than making the mistake to begin with. Now you're double down on it. And it's, it was blatantly, he blatantly said, poor you. So, like, essentially, we get to give two answers to every question. From no, because he didn't like, give two answers. He gave one answer and half of another answer. The only full word he completed was France. And uh, hey, congratulations. Like, I'm, I hope you celebrated, like, uh, like champ tends to celebrate uh, over the course of the last week because you certainly deserved it. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Adrian, it's me thing. and you against it's the establishment this week, pal. It's me and you against yeah. the establishment. Wait your, wait your buddy. Uh, yeah. final Even if you add up your two scores, you probably still won't win. <laughs> yeah, before you get your intro, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever, go on. Our final contestant today is extremely happy with the news this week that GEA teams won't be allowed to train together for some time. It means he can keep making those gains by himself in the wilds of County Clare. No one can see him, but he's turning himself into a point-scoring, two-footed, dummy soloing machine in the deserted GA pitches west of Shannon. You're not going to want to cross this guy when he's back. Give it up for Tommy Rooney. Hi, guys. You're welcome. Just I am uh, working on. I am working on a new dummy. What? Which is? How, how does it go? You'll see it down the line, lads. You, you'll see it when we're all back. Looking forward. To that. I I've fallen over like the first few times. I presumed you were um, you were going to make some sort of a joke about intercounty training not being allowed to happen and that being totally irrelevant to Tommy. Yeah, I realised midway through the intro that that would have been much funnier, but uh, <laughs> I didn't think of that when I wrote it. So uh, there you go. Thank you for that. No devices as ever. It's uh, a reminder that there has been cheating going on and it sickens us. So please, no devices. Round one. Tommy. The boring questions round. Never multiple I haven't been, been here. <laughs> All the questions here will do with 2007. Adrian, question one for you. Steve McLaren's short-lived stint as England manager came to an end in 2007, but who was his assistant who also departed at the time? Stuart Pearce. No. Oh, he was everybody's assistant. Alan Anyone? Todd? No. Southgate? No. Steve McLaren's... Oh, um, little Sammy Lee? No. Uh, ah. Terry Venables? Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow, forgotten history. hundred guesses I wouldn't have got, Terry. Um, Someone clearly hasn't been reading up on their 2007 no. Wikipedia in preparation for this quiz. Uh, every, time I sit down for the, every time I sit down for this quiz, I go, God damn it. Why uh, didn't I think of something <laughs> well, that might have happened in 2007? 
I haven't been invited on for some reason for like, like two weeks, so I don't even know what year you're on. I know for I know for a fact Mark. you're going to ask who scored Ireland's goals in Cyprus. Uh, no, Cyprus was in 2006. Oh, great! You should have <laughs> I did a pinpoint straight away for the <laughs> uh, question. I think I think it was the home game was in 2006. No, you're right, yeah. which you will get to later. Uh, question four for you, Nathan. Uh, Patrick Harrington won his first major in 2007, beating Sergio Garcia in a playoff at Carnoustie. On mm. which hole did Harrington birdie in the playoff? Garcia bogeyed this hole, and it was the winning of the claret jug for Harrington, essentially. As in, from hole one to eighteen, or which, like first, second, or third, fourth uh, hole listen, in the there's playoff? No hole one to eighteen. Um, the seventeenth. No. It was the same answer for regardless of which way you wanted to look at it. It was hole one, and it was the first hole. That is where uh, Harrington got that bogey. A God, golf that was question some... incorrect. Jesus. Tommy. Talk up, Nathan. Another one of your specialist topics. Gone. <laughs> what specialist topic? Special... You've been in his house. In his house. Like, I mean, I don't think Tommy's been in this person's house when I ask him a question about this guy. Which Cork Garda, Tommy, was top of the scoring charts in the 2007 All-Ireland Football Championship despite his county getting hammered in the All-Ireland Final? James Masters. And no, I've never been in his house. Correct. Did you Google that beforehand? Well, no, but like, how many other free-taking Gardaí have played for Cork in the 2000s? It's true. Uh, round two is the end of Stan round. October 2007 saw the end of Steve Staunton as Ireland manager, as the media and injuries totally screwed him over, as opposed to anything else. Question two for you, Adrian. The, the, who is... This what have you done, Adrian? Oh, he's Googling. Where's Adrian's he Googling. He's Googling. Oh, he's gone oh, sideways. Look at him. Oh. He's Googling. Oh. That is a disgrace. This that's is terrific. Zoom. This is some uh, great technology from Zoom that if somebody's cheating... Yeah. Oh, that's, that's embarrassing. Oh, my God. I can't believe it. But let's see if you wow. can Google this. Oh, lads. You're not, it's, not even worth, it's not even worth responding to. Oh, where's Tommy gone? Oh, Tommy's after Googling as well. <laughs> <laughs> the winner. The champion. Okay. Hey, I, I didn't pick up anything that happened in the last couple of minutes there. Because I was, uh, let's call it oh. Googling. But, uh, Go on, share your screen there. Show us what you've got. Please don't. This is a family show. <laughs> Adrian, hey, this, is about, this round is about the end of Steve Staunton uh, as Ireland manager. The one-all draw against Cyprus was Staunton's last game as Ireland manager, Adrian. Who scored Ireland's late, late equaliser in Croke Park that night? Stephen Ireland. No. Didn't even let him finish the question. Sorry, which one? Who scored the late equaliser for Ireland against... I would have said I would have said Robbie Keane uh, Steve Finnan Steve Finnan correct um, Stephen Ireland is against San Marino it's the only time I've ever been do I get half a point for having his first name correct no Steve no. Finnan jeez where, where is Steve Finnan these days uh, London keeps his head down doesn't want to do any interviews he'd be no great how many times you try our, our, our cold commentaries I'd say or, or anything that uh, uh, involves yeah. him being in public Nathan pulling back the curtain there on how he spends his Thursday <laughs> afternoons question two for you Nathan Ireland finished third in their Euro 2008 qualifying group. Who finished fourth? Look at the blinks. Blink once. Is it, wait, 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 he's going to give us a lot of information now that's totally irrelevant <laughs> to the question to let us know how clever he is. <laughs> Who did? Andorra? No. Cyprus? Anyone? No. Slovakia. Ah! Yeah. And Wales finished fifth. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, question two for you, Tommy. Which club did Staunton manager after lose, manage after losing his job as Ireland boss? Does it begin with D or C? Ah, come on. Uh, was it Doncaster or Rovers? Is it Doncaster or Cambridge? Was it Doncaster? No. And it does begin with D, Darlington? though. Darlington. 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 Correct. Ah, Darlington. 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 Uh, question three. Dagging him. <laughs> Dagging him. <laughs> Dagging him in Redbridge. Uh, round Dead three Dead. is the 2007 Rugby World Cup round. So Ugh. 2007 is fondly remembered as just another year where Ireland got to feel an injection of pain on the rugby front. It happened in France and it is still being spoken about. Question three for you, Adrian. Who was the oldest player included in Ireland's 2007 Rugby World Cup squad? Oof. I'm going to say it was two 
Was it Alan Quinlan? No, he was second eldest. Was it the bull? It was the bull John Hayes. Nathan. So I get, that should be another half point for... Getting the answer wrong. Getting yeah, it could be, yeah. Nearly getting there. Right, question three for you, Nathan. Name the out half who kicked South Africa to victory in the 07 Rugby World Cup final. You can make an educated guess here, couldn't you? Why? Yeah, you need to be educated, though, Tommy. That's the difficulty there. Brumch. Percy Montgomery. Correct. Indeed, Percy Montgomery. Nathan scores his first point of the quiz. Here, uh, you and me both, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> now that's that's a fishy one. Why? What do you mean? Where did where did you pull that one out of? Just knowledge, Tommy. You know, no, I, some things yeah. are just some things are just there in your head. Question three for you, Tommy. Which back row forward was excluded from Eddie O'Sullivan's World Cup squad that year? Famously saying, ah, Bar Eddie calling me Graham, my older brother's name, for two seasons. That was the only time he got my name right and talked to me when talking about the moment he got cut. Uh, Jamie ah, come on, no. Correct. Ah, this is, like, that was like a, a two-yard knock-in. I'd like you know a free what? kick from, you know from, from 45 you yards out. If you, hadn't said, if you hadn't said the quote, I would have been stuck at a 50-50 there. But uh, the quote, the quote just brought me back to 2007. Listen, sure, he was only a baba in 2007, lads. He deserves the leg up when it comes to these sort of questions. Uh, round four. Thanks. Thanks a lot. What age were you, Tommy? Doing my junior sir. No, I wasn't. I was in second year, 2007. I was 14. Jesus. See? Yeah, retaining all sorts of sports information that I yes. lads forget yes. about. Exactly. Uh, round four. The Didn't first... watch rugby though when I was that age. Uh, round four, the fun free magic number round. Contestants get three points for getting the number exactly right here. If no one manages that, the nearest contestant who doesn't go bust gets two points. The second closest gets one point. I'm going to say that we can only accept the answer that's written on your paper. I'm also going to have to ask for your pens once the music ends. So if you don't mind, give us the following number. The number of total games won by Steve Staunton as Ireland manager. Plus the number of different clubs Staunton played for, plus the number of majors won by Ricky Fowler, plus the number of points Ireland had to spare against Georgia in their 2007 Rugby World Cup Pool D win. Your 30 seconds ah, expire when Sinatra sings Bright Shiny Beads. Uh, the the first of, one, does that include friendlies? Yes. The number of total games won by Steve Staunton as Ireland manager, not just in the Euro qualifying. Plus the number of different clubs, clubs he played for. Clubs he played for. Okay. Uh, does it clubs. include his? Does it include his club, his Gaelic football club? No. Shut up. Obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number of majors won by Ricky Fowler, and then Ireland against Georgia. Your time is up. Pens down. Papers, please. Who's showing their paper to the screen first? Adrian's got sixteen. Nathan's got fourteen. Tommy's gone for twenty-one. The answer is. 17. Adrian gets two points. Yes. Nathan gets one point. Tommy gets nothing here. Boom. To go through those answers, the number of total games won by Stan as Ireland manager? Four. Four. Six. Oh, Jesus. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> uh, the number of different clubs <laughs> Steve Staunton played for? Three. Five. Seven. Five. Seven. Two clubs. Liverpool, Villa, Dundalk, Bradford City, Crystal Palace, Coventry City, Walsall. Right, you are. The number of majors won by Ricky Fowler? Zero. Zero. And the number of points Ireland beat Georgia by in 07? Eight. Six. Four. Four. Correct. Bang on the money. So, Nathan, you're on two points. Adrian, you're on two points. Tommy, you're on two points. We have a three-way tie oh. going in. Well, this is really, really tricky. So, what we're going to do is we're going to put... I Adrian tossed against... four coins earlier. We're going to put Adrian against Nathan in a toss first off. And whoever what? wins that plays Tommy in a, in a toss. So Adrian against it's like Nathan. a relegation playoff. Uh, no, but Tommy's after getting a bye then. That's actually very, Tommy, well done you for getting the bye. Uh, Adrian this, has against... this ever happened before? No, this is truly unprecedented times with a crappy quiz. Can, Can you, you actually do a toss? As I scroll... Oh, look, will we, will we do an actual toss this time? That's yeah, a good idea. Yeah, 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 yeah. Actual well, toss. I mean, you were about to stick me in there, so I'm sort of... Rather than your makey-uppy. Okay, so... I've been actual money in a long time. Adrian, heads or tails? Heads. Do you know which side is heads? Heads. 
So what? Yeah. Nice uh, you progressed Tommy, to the Tommy final play, Tommy. Uh, Tommy heads or tails? Tommy uh, I'll go heads as well. It's tails. It's tails. So ah, that means yeah. Adrian gets to go first. And uh, surely second. there should be surely there should be a toss now between me and Tommy to see who goes second. Yeah, heads or tails? Yeah, come on. Uh, I'll go heads. Oh no. Tails it is. So Tommy gets to go second. Oh, second. Nathan is in third. Okay. Rude. That was exciting, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. That it was, was great. That's what an extra great ring. And oh, by the way, like normally like something more than a five cent coin, I would say, but you know. We, we, we could actually just going off the back of the last episode of the last dance zone, we could have a, a round here, a coin toss round. We, that's a great shout. That's a like a virtual a virtual coin toss round. That's uh, we, doesn't we sound do very that. exciting. Uh, oh, I'm buzzing about this. Uh, that's great. We, we need to dedicate a whole new show to that. Uh, in the meantime, let's do the rapid fire round. So to <clears> explain <throat> the rapid fire round for anybody who's joining us for the first time, 40 seconds for everybody to answer from the same set of questions. We're going to start with uh, Adrian, as we've said, Tommy in second, and then Nathan in third. If you get a question right, I'll ask you another question and keep asking you questions until you get one wrong. And once you get a question wrong, I move on to the next person and your incorrect answer also means a deduction of one point. Adrian Barry, are you ready? I am ready, Owen. Your 40 seconds starts now. Which club holds the record for the most points in a single Premier League season? Time. Time's up. Manchester City. Uh, in what year did the, the Galway last play in an All-Ireland hurling final, Tommy? Uh, 2017. No, 2018. Oh. Uh, Nathan, ah. did Fergus McFadden make above or below 30 <laughs> test appearances for Ireland? Above. Correct. Uh, name Rory McIlroy's wife. Uh, oh. Time. Time. Too long. Oh, no. Who was manager of Crystal Palace, Adrian? Tony Woodcock, I don't know. <laughs> Roy Hodge, <laughs> who finished second in the now cancelled league on, Tommy? And time is up. Uh, oh. Monaco. No, oh, Marseille. Ah. Nathan Murphy wins. No. no. Hang on a second. Hang on a second. How did he win? I yes. said, what happened with the first you know, six, six, six seconds. You took oh, you took seconds. forever. I actually said it really quickly. You no, you didn't. Forever. In my years, right? No, I'm sorry, we didn't. In my years, as as you were saying time, I was saying Man City. No, you said no. it like 19... Exactly. In my years, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, but your no, ears are slow, Pat. I, I gave no, you like double the allocated it's, time. It's, it, was, it was a Wi-Fi. There's a feckin' Wi-Fi issue, as we had earlier. Yeah, on. yeah. It's like, honestly, oh, yeah. That's a, it's... I, I, can, I, I can honestly see your predicament. It's like Steve Staunton and uh, the media at the time. Like, yeah. the Wi-Fi did completely screw you over. And um, No, it's more like Henri. What did, what did I get wrong? I actually what got, did I get the, wrong I the, got the correct answer within time. 20, 2018. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Tommy, even, even, though, you, even though I was screwed over by the coin toss. Coin toss. <laughs> 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 you were, Nathan. You were screwed over by the time. Uh, I have somehow managed to come back and... That I must be on what three in a row now. I don't know. These must be the two most unsatisfying back to back victories ever, but nevertheless, you are the winner no, yet no, again, Nathan there's, Murphy. Congratulations. Well, it's there's, no, there's, there's no such thing your, as a bad, crappy quiz first win. First question correct. Like, first question correct, and then I got shafted. That's, I, 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 that's. Can I get another chance? Well, Tony 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 the, the, full outrage. <laughs> the, the full outrage is off the charts today. Lads, thanks a million. Wow. Crappy it's quiz. Back next week. Tweet us at Off the Ball Pleasure. if you've got any questions. 2008 quiz is up next. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. They spoke about.